Welcome back to Northern Perspective, everyone. I'm Cypher. And I'm Fox. As many of you know, GC Strategies founder Christian Firth appeared before committee last week where he was completely destroyed by Conservative MPs Michael Barrett, Garnet Genuis, and Larry Brock. Subsequent to that meeting, Michael Barrett promised to bring Christian Firth back this week to answer more questions. Before that happens, Cameron McDonald was called in to testify today, who is the linchpin to the entire government corruption and misconduct allegations by Butler. Joining him is Antonio Utano, who is on record as having received the first complaint filed by Butler in September of 2021. This complaint went absolutely nowhere, which is one of the reasons he was brought in to testify today. Just a couple of points before we get started. Unfortunately, Barnaby is unavailable tonight, so please be kind to one another in the chat, as you usually are. Secondly, this is a reminder that unlike our normal Sunday live streams, we will not be meeting in Discord after the stream, and we are not able to respond to questions aside from Super Chats as we anticipate this stream to run for at least three hours. Uh, if you're watching this after the fact, we suggest... Uh, we suggest that you watch our running series on this entitled Scammed on Arrival, which can be found in the description. We would also like to say thank you to Austin Gautier for a $50 super chat. Let the games begin. Yes, indeed. And also Jer Savoy for gifting five Northern Perspective memberships before we even got started. Thank you both. So it's amazing to have everybody on here. We have 217 people. Don't forget to like the stream. Remember, every like that you put on here, um, pushes the video out to encourage other people to um, actually get into the the stream and suggest it to them. That's what, what YouTube uses in order to um, decide what videos to push out. So the more likes we have, the more uh, the the odds are that this vi stream is going to be pushed out to everybody. I can't talk tonight, everybody. I've been I've been waiting all day for this stream, so I'm just He's very excited. I'm very yeah. excited to get into this. So anyhow. Um, we hope we have a couple of, couple of special guests in, the, in the chat and, uh, without further ado, let the games begin. For the delay, of course we had votes. Welcome to meeting number 84, the House of Commons Standing Committee on Government Operations and Estimates. Pursuant to SO of course, the audio is always, and the always low at the OGO. On Monday, October 17, 2022, the committee is meeting on the study of the riot can application. Just a friendly reminder not to put air, our earpieces next to the microphone as it causes feedback and potential injury to our interpreters. Before we start with our opening statements, just very quickly, um, order papers, uh, or sorry, um, papers that we've asked to be uh, tabled here. Just a quick update, uh, Mr. Firth has been in contact with our committee regarding bank records related to GC strategies. Pointing his accountant because of payments are older, it's gonna require one or two extra days to produce the information. We originally planned to have them already, but it's gonna be a couple more days, which I think is acceptable. Second order for production of documents, different versions of the resumes of the two Butler witnesses have been received and are now just with translation. We're going to start with uh, Mr. McDonald, I understand, for five-minute opening statement, then uh, Mr. Utano. Please go ahead, Mr. McDonald. Chair, honorable members du comité parlementaire, I have some... Your members of this committee. However, I'm going to add some words today because of some events of last night. There has been a concerted effort to portray Mr. Utano and myself as corrupt. The narrative is compelling, but it's based on untrue allegations. The falsehoods and innuendo have been plastered in the national press. Senior CBSA officials have distanced themselves from us. Nos carrières ont été suspendues. Our careers were suspended. Our lives upset. From Ms. Simmons, someone I do not know. I hope you go to jail. Amongst other things, you are corrupt, greedy, a sorry excuse for a human being. I hope you are ashamed. I hope you seek redemption. These are all based on falsehoods. There was no cozy relationship, no conspiracy, and no fraud involving Mr. Utano or myself. I'm grateful to have the opportunity to finally present the truth, address the extraordinary allegations that have been raised by Butler AI, and to show the facts that have been, that you have been misled. 
Je commencerai par pour vous présenter like to begin by presenting the context of Arrive Canada. National mobile application for Canadians to re-enter the country. CBSA's contracting authority, the finance branch, authorized the sole source and PSPC negotiated the terms and authored the final contract. Our innovation team was given less than five days to pursue options. Six companies were evaluated. GC Strategies and Deloitte were the only vendors willing and able to satisfy the requirements in the narrow time frame. I was not involved in the GC Strategies vetting. Two options were presented to my superior, then Vice President and Chief Information Officer Min Doan. Min Doan specifically rejected the Deloitte as an option. Time out. Okay, there's already a problem here. There is already a problem here. Um, I specifically remember the testimony by Min Doan as saying he didn't make the decision on Arrive Camp. If he's rejecting a vendor, that implies that he's making a decision on a rive can. So that's the first piece. Um, the second piece is that he said he didn't know who made the decision on a rive can. So already we have a conflict between the CTO of the government of Canada, chief technology officer who used to be in CBSA Canada Border Services Agency, love all these government acronyms, right? And Mr. McDonald here, who was a director general at the time in CBSA, who was would have been under Mindone at that time. And there's a problem here. So we're not even a couple minutes in and someone's lying. Okay. Now, given how close Mr. McDonald has been alleged to be with Mr. Firth, so far, he's the most likely candidate. Okay? So, already, Mr. McDonald's having some problems. And I imagine that the committee is going to be calling him on that, saying, well, Min Doan says he wasn't involved in the decision. How do you explain that? So, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be listening for that question. Also, before we get going, thank you very much to uh, Jarsha for the $10 super chat. Just wanted to say congratulations on passing 25,000 subs. Thank you very much. Also, what happened to uh, the weekend live stream? Never got a chance to watch. So the weekend live stream, um, as we said at the beginning of it, uh, it was a sensitive topic. And um, we, we had a friend come to us afterwards, someone who we trust very much, and said, you two might want to consider taking that down because... You have all these different phrases in there that, although you're not necessarily saying anything bad, somebody, some lefty who's like really intent on shutting you guys down can just come in there, clip whatever they want, mash it all together because you guys don't show your faces. So it's really just audio clips, mash it all together and make it sound horrible. Don't give them that opportunity. I highly suggest that you take it down. And since we respect this person very much and we trust their opinion, that's exactly what we did. Uh, we still have it. We haven't deleted it. So at some point, we w hope to be able to put it back up. But for the time being, um, we, we've taken it down. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll see what the future brings for, for that stream. So apologies to those that didn't get to see it. Um, but... Um, Unfortunately, when you start to do well on YouTube and you're a right-leaning channel, you make a lot of enemies, apparently. So um, so we're just try, uh, trying to protect ourselves even further. And uh, thank you very much to Rhiannon Gadsden for a $7 super chat. Just finished watching the whole thing on CPAC. Can't wait to hear your take on it. Well, you already started, so there you go. <laughs> All right, let's get back to it, Mr. McDonald. Deloitte had, in fact, been my preference. As a result of the direction given to proceed by Mr. Doan, GC Strategies was recommended to the contracting authority. As the Director General of Innovation, the decision was never mine to make. Pendant 12 mois, j'ai dirigé. During 12 months, I led the team developing and scaling ArriveCAN until May 2021. And during my involvement, all task authorizations provided to GCS were met on time and within budget. I provided a costing for ArriveCAN and it was $6.3 million. 
This was shared with my colleagues and my supervisor. Ensuite, you can sound Butler AI. With regard to Butler AI, their allegations are unsubstantiated. This committee, they began to collapse. They told this committee they believed their chatbot would make them $26 million a year. Their disappointment has turned into a campaign of baseless accusations against Mr. Utano and I. Wow. Okay. Um, let's, let's unpack that one a bit, eh? So already he is trying to distort what the Butler team said. For the record, they didn't say that they thought this was going to make them $26 million. What they said is Christian Firth anticipated that this was going to make them $26 million. And they have recordings of Mr. Firth bragging about his relationship with you, Mr. McDonald, and with other alleged influential people within the federal government that was going to allow them to deploy this across all of the different agencies. And that's where Christian Firth came up with that potential number. Okay, so already, already this guy's on a bad foot with me. I was willing to give him the benefit of the doubt, but already he's on a bad foot because he clearly didn't watch the testimony of the Butler folks, didn't hear the recording that was published, or is intentionally fabricating that. Either way, his statement is incorrect. Honestly, he was a, on a bad footing with me. As soon as he opened his mouth, he made himself out to be the victim. Um, I, I always find it particularly odd when people do that in this kind of setting. But to me, it seems especially odd when it's a man who's supposed to be like this head of the department. Like it just, it seems really disingenuous and it, 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 it seems like a tactic. You know what I mean? I don't know. It doesn't sit right with me. The other thing that's a little strange to me is his insertion of a few sentences of French here and there. To me, it seems like he's trying to position himself as to be a, a statesman, um, to be politically correct and above reproach. It's, it's just the vibe I'm getting. Um, I don't know if anybody else is feeling that, but his French is not very good. And it just seems almost virtue signaling to, to a degree that he's inserting a couple of sentences in there. And it's very distracting. And maybe that's, maybe that's by design. But it's just very strange. So, anyway. Before we continue, we have 428 watching and 287 thumbs up. Please give us a thumbs up. It helps push out the stream. Yes, it'll suggest it to more people. Let's get to the total viewers up to 1,000 again. That's 1,000 uh, more educated Canadians. Let's go. The facts are, in 2019, Dalian and Karatex competed fairly for a general services IT contract. On November the 19th, 2019, I received an unsolicited, jointly branded GCS and Butler proposal for Bill C-65. The department, the HR department was the client and the decision maker for the work with Butler. A feasibility study was asked for by CBSA that had six parts. There was never a pilot in scope what no no back the truck up you're telling me you are telling me that a it staffing vendor and a ai company approached you saying hey cameron we have a neat solution and then you said oh that's nice go talk to hr and then someone in hr decided to hire these guys and made the technology decision about that? Are you high? Really? That is in no way believable in any organization. Not at all. The decision makers, in order to actually look at a project like that, alleging it was four hundred and fifty or $420,000 like we've had testimonies from other people. You're going to have to have your chief information officer sign off on that. You're going to have to have your president sign off on that. So already that's Min and that's John Oswowski. Automatically, 
HR doesn't make decisions on technology unless they are running the technology project. But even then, it's still the technology people that get involved. This is the way it works. So there's a lot of deflection already going on right here, uh, everybody. Keep your BS meter on at full tilt because of, I have a feeling that there's going to be a dump truck load coming. My VP instructed me directly to help them deliver an executive appropriate presentation. I advised my VP that CBSA would use an existing contract. The proper contracting processes were followed. PSBC has validated this. I have had an unblemished reputation in the public service for 23 years. That's because nobody's noticed you. I have you. competed openly for every single promotion I have ever received, starting at an entry level position as a student. My actions have always been guided by a commitment to the public interest. The allegations have been painted are incomplete, inaccurate, and they've done a misleading narrative. The reality, along with the accountability of the leadership of the CBSA, is that the result of my reputation and the careers of good public servants are being shattered. Je vous remercie. I thank you, members of the committee, for allowing me the opportunity to share the facts openly and honestly. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Uh, Mr. Utano, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair and members of this committee, je vous remercie de m'avoir donné le cas. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today to answer your questions regarding the Arrive Canada study, and most recently, allegations made by Butler AI regarding work undertaken during my time at CBSA. It has been conveyed to this committee that I committed wrongdoing. I have not. My reputation and career have been attacked and damage inflicted on both me personally and professionally. Today I will present the facts. I will speak clearly and honestly about all my actions. I welcome transparency and accountability. We have provided a brief to this committee with evidence that will substantiate all <clears throat> statements and facts outlined below. Regarding ArriveCan, at the onset of COVID pandemic, I was an executive director at CBSA responsible for the prototype design a division that included the Mobile Centre of Excellence team. In early March 2020, the Public Health Agency of Canada, PHAC, asked CBSA for urgent assistance to develop technical capabilities needed for contact tracing at the border. No such capabilities existed at that time. The technical team was responsible for assessing technical solutions needed to fill this operational response on an extremely urgent timeline. Option analyses of this magnitude typically take months. We were given less than five days. The technical team assessed six in total. Internal development was determined as not feasible, given a shortage of skill set, capacity, and the urgent timeline. Really? All right. <laughs> okay, before I go on here, uh, Krusty Canuck with a $10 super chat. Thank you very much. Not enough, quote unquote, big words to describe the dog's breakfast that the liberal slash allies cover ups have shown us in the past few days. <laughs> Shaking my effing head. <laughs> Welcome to the live stream, uh, Krusty Canuck. Everybody, uh, you should check out Krusty Canuck's uh, podcast. It's the Krusty Canuck podcast. He usually has the Tuesday rant, so that would have gone live today if he pre-recorded it. Can't wait to watch your show after this, Krusty. After this might be tomorrow, so my apologies. <laughs> It'll be a late night. But um, also, Krusty is a uh, military veteran of our country, so thank you for your service, sir, and anybody else that's in the chat that is also a veteran, thank you eternally for your service. Um, We've got 501 viewers and 366 likes. Please give us a thumbs up. I will stop bugging you so much when those numbers match. There you go. Um, so, okay. So you're saying if, if it takes you months to select a vendor for a project, you should be fired. I'm sorry, but you should. Um, yes, this is complex, but you should be fired. I'm sorry. Um, second piece, well, I'm not sorry. Second piece is that you said you only had five days. How does that even make sense? You only have five days. I'm interested in, the, in this five days. I want them to expand on that. Who said you have to make a decision on a vendor within five days? That's, that's a very bizarre timeline. That's one work week. That's, that's not making sense to me. Especially when, when Cameron is saying he came back with a cost of $6 million. Really? So you want to develop requirements, select a vendor, 
and sign that vendor within five days and you call that due diligence of spending six million dollars of taxpayer money i'll give you two weeks if for an urgent project that i, I don't buy that and if that is the case and someone gave you that requirement then something is wrong with that let's continue an outsourced option was deemed necessary. The two possible outsourced options were presented, the Deloitte and GC Strategy Solutions. Both options were sent to the Vice President and Chief Information Officer, Min Doan, for consideration and decision. At a, at a team meeting, we were informed that the Deloitte solution was discounted, leaving the only option of mobilizing the GC Strategy Solution. Ah, okay. So, both, both Mr. McDonald and M M Utano obviously got together to align their stories before this happened. Mindone says he doesn't know who on his team made the decision. Yet, both of these guys are saying that Mindone made the decision. Now, they're doing it in a very bizarre way where they're saying, well, what, what Mindone did is he rejected Deloitte. Well, that means he chose GC Strategies. Come on. Unless Mindone didn't choose GC strategies, right? So someone's lying. Someone's lying here, which means there's corruption in this agency. One way or the other. One way or the other, these guys have exposed corruption, whether it's them or whether it's Mindone, or maybe it's all three of them. We're still about 100 likes behind. Please give us a thumbs up. It helps share this uh, stream with other Canadians who might want to watch it. The Arrive Can app and all its technical components evolved considerably throughout the pandemic from the original concept design. It was created through the collaboration of CBSA employees and over 19 technology vendors, one of which was GC Strategies. The entire agency's pandemic contact tracing response cost $55 million. This is not all technology development. The breakdown of the spending is published information, and I have included it again for reference. All GC Strategies task authorizations related to Arrive Can followed all procurement guidelines. Contracting was overseen and managed by PSPC. My responsibility remained to ensure the technology requirements were met and delivered on time, and they were. I will now address a separate issue of Baller AI. To be clear, Baller AI did not work on ArriveCAN and in no way was part of the ArriveCAN program. Yes, all of you keep telling My us this. My involvement with the Botler feasibility study was limited. On September 27, 2021, shortly after I assumed the role of Acting Director General, I received an email from Ms. Dutt with a CC to my team. The email raised two issues, a late payment to Butler from the prime contractor, Dalian Karadix, and the second was discontent regarding a private partnership they established specifically around the collaboration between Butler AI, Dalian Karadix, and GC Strategies. The CBSA responded to Ms. Dutt within 24 hours. This included resolution to the delayed payment and a remind, reminded, we reminded Ms. Dutt that the contract between CBSA and Dalian Karadix had contractual privacy clauses preventing us, CBSA, from discussing private or proprietary matters with subcontractors. That is complete garbage. So for, for those of you that may not understand what's going on there, um, so he's saying that the complaint that uh, Ratika Dutt sent uh, included a issue of not being paid, and then the other issue talking about the problematic relationship between Dalian Karadix, GC Strategies, and Botler, because Botler was not aware about Dalian and Karadix. Now, this guy is saying, oh, well, we can't disclose that contract with Dalian. Well, that doesn't make sense, sir, because that contract that all of this is hinging on is allegedly for the Botler project. So how can you say you're signing a contract that if Christian Firth is telling the truth, which, eh, we don't know, specifically mentions GC Strategies and Butler in the contract, how can you, you then turn around and say that we can't discuss that contract with you because of privacy concerns, yet you are the beneficiary of all of the Butler work throw, flowing up through GC Strategies, through Dalian, and back into the CBSA. So you're allowed to view all of their work, but they're not allowed to re review the initial contract? 
That is completely, completely sketchy. I have a big problem with that. So, anyway, I could probably spend another 15 minutes on that, but I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to bow out and let Fox jump in here. So we have a two dollar super chat from Matthew Galligan. How about being honest, lest you remember? That's right. That's what Judge Judy says. If you're telling the truth, you don't need a good memory. Miss Dutt's letter raised no concerns and no allegations about the CBSA or any of its employees, past or present. In fact, on a follow-up email the next day, Miss Dutt praised the good relationship and positive experience she enjoyed to date working with the CBSA and its employees. Moreover, she expressed, her, she expressed her appreciation for the prompt action and the matter was considered close. In December of 2021, CBSA's Human Resources Branch, the client for the work, requested the cancellation of the Butler AI task authorization, citing capacity and staffing issues. The TA was canceled and I had no further contact with Butler AI. Okay, that's a different reason. Sorry, I'm, I'm going to be pausing on uh, on all of these points that are very inconsistent between the, the testimonies of Dalian slash Cordex, GC Strategies, um, Botler, and now these guys. So recall Dalian, who was the holder of the contract. Mr. Wood, recall. He said that CBSA canceled the contract due to unsatisfactory work from Botler. Utano just said that the reason that the, the contract was cancelled was because of staffing agencies and capacity or staffing, staffing issues and capacity. That doesn't sound like unsatisfactory work. Okay? Wow, there's so many lies going on here. There's so many different versions of the truth. Uh, thank you to Jess44 with a thirteen ninety nine super sticker. Very cute little pup. <laughs> and I uh, just want to address this question from Chantal A. Is Dalian the same as Corodex? I'm confused on that part. Um, so we do explain it a little bit better um, and in more detail in some of our previous videos in this series. But basically, Dalian and Corodex, they're... Um, they operate as two companies when they want to, and then they operate as one company when they want to. So they share the exact same office, the exact same staff. They have even the same fax number, um, but they're like they're different executives. Two, yeah, two different guys. And then when they want to be one company, when it benefits them, they act as one company. And when they want to be two separate companies, when it benefits them, they act as two separate companies. And we actually have some more information on that that we're probably going to share tomorrow. Um, that uh, kind of goes into the origin of Dalian, Cordex, and GC Strategies. And it's very interesting. But um, the, other, the other thing to consider with Dalian Cordex, so Dalian is classified as an indigenously owned organization. So they get priority preference for government contracts because of a indigenous spending program that the government has. So... Cordex and Dalian could compete as two separate companies on a contract if they wanted to, and thereby guaranteeing that one of them gets it, right? Because the requirement is at least two vendors. And thank you very much to Daniel for a twenty-four ninety-nine super chat. You are amazing. You're amazing for giving us that twenty-four ninety-nine super chat and joining the stream. Thank you very, very much. All right, let's get into more lies. I will close on a personal note. I have worked in the technology field for over 25, 24 years where I have dealt with highly sensitive files, operations, five IVs, partnerships, and both domestically and internationally. I understand the seriousness of ensuring that my actions remain bound to the professionalism demanded of a position in the federal public service. I have always upheld these values. Thank you for your time, and I'm willing to answer any questions you may have. One more point on Dalian. There's only two employees. There's the, there's the CEO and two staff, and they're not Indigenous. So, there you go. I'll see. Thank you, uh, Mr. Utano. Uh, Ms. Cousy, please, for six minutes. Stephanie Cousy. Thank you very much, Chair. On November 4th, 2019, two young entrepreneurs, Ratika Dutt and Amir Morv, were contacted by Christian Firth of GC Strategies regarding a Government of Canada project. 
On November 30th, Firth stated, I had a great chat with Cameron from CBSA, and they will act as fast as they can to get you a commitment. Over the course of our interactions, Firth repeatedly stated that the CBSA was very interested, said Ms. Dutt. Firth repeatedly communicated that Cameron McDonald would need to receive benefits as consideration for his role and influence in bringing Butler, their company, to the Government of Canada. Firth stated that McDonald had then CBSA President John Oswoski's ear and that for Cameron, it's more than credit. I just want to be sure that he's taken care of. The principals met with McDonald several times. During a meeting called by McDonald on January 22, 2020, at the Marriott Spin Cafe, McDonald confirmed over drinks with the principal's first statements regarding implementation of Bottler as a CBSA pathfinder for the entire Government of Canada wide implementation. During another in person meeting called by McDonald on February 6, 2020, which was also attended by Antonio Utano and others, McDonald provided precise instructions and wording on how to pitch Butler to the president to ensure success. So I love that Stephanie's doing this because this completely undermines Cameron's point of, ah, I was just standing there, guys, and, and GC Strategies and Butler just came to me and said, here, here's a product, right? Like, it completely undermines that point when it's Cameron called a meeting, Cameron called a meeting, Cameron called a meeting. <laughs> um, this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun. During the period, McDonald continued to provide intelligence to Firth on internal high-level executive meetings regarding Bottler that were above his pay grade. McDonald provided direct instructions to be provided via Firth to Bottler and the principals in order to guide interactions with other CBSA employees. McDonald also assigned work delegated to him by his superiors to Bottler for completion at the last minute. Firth regularly asserted McDonald's influence and insisted that Butler provide whatever was asked by the CBSA, as Cam has a very big stick and can get what he wants. This is this is part of the evidence, no doubt, that Butler provided committee that we haven't heard, everybody. No doubt. And there's a reason we haven't heard it. There's a reason it hasn't been made aware uh, available. And that's so that the witnesses coming on don't have a chance to review it and create testimony to rebut it. Yeah, so they can't spin their web of lies before they get to committee because they have no idea what they're going to face when they get to committee. Right. There was a comment earlier that I saw in chat um, uh, when I have the time to look where it said, um, no doubt these two have been watching all the testimony so they can get their story straight. 100% that's what they've been doing. Unless they're dumb and you know they, they don't seem like dumb guys. But they can't account for what Bottler has and what they've sent to the committee. So that's what's happening now. Um, and aware, your comment made me uh, chuckle quite a bit. Uh, thank you for the $28 uh, dollar super chat. Just want to thank you guys for doing this coverage because you make me sound so smart when I talk about to other people. <laughs> and you know, that's honestly the point. Like, that's the reason that we do this is because we want to arm Canadians with the information that they need to make good choices at the polling station and also so that they know what's going on in the country. Like, the government wasting $54 million of taxpayer money is a huge, huge problem. And, and we want Canadians to understand exactly how this happened. And Chantel A with a $2 super chat. Thank you for explaining the Dalian Court. Explain our pleasure. Absolutely our pleasure. If you want to see the more deep dive into it, check out our playlist, um, which is the uh, uh, arri uh, Scammed on Arrival. And this will be added to it um, following the, the stream today. And Shed Dwelling Hermit, welcome back, sir, with a $5 super chat. Do you think the lying between all parties involved was discussed by all of them to muddy the waters, to make it hard to pinpoint the main culprit? I, I don't think they're that, I don't think they're that coordinated. I think right now it's every group for themselves. So I think Dalian and Cordex, they're looking out for themselves. GC Strategies is trying to look out for them. And there's probably a couple guys in the government that are good buddies that they're trying to look at for themselves. So Mindone obviously is no friends of these guys. I think Utano and, and McDonald are probably pretty tight. So I think each of them is just trying to 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 hold their own as, as best they can. But 
this is all going to be exposed very, very quickly, I think. And we're still about 70 likes behind, so please hit the thumbs up. It helps push the stream out to other Canadians who need to see this. They know where he's going in the organization and how fast. Over multiple years of interactions with both Firth and the CBSA, mid-management, it has become evident that conscious efforts are made by both parties to isolate and control the flow and narrative of information to the CBSA executive leadership. In this instance, the leadership is defined as the agency's president, vice president, and C-level executives. That's been done too. As early as two, November 2019, while Firth was actively communicating messages from McDonald to Butler, as discussed earlier, first stated that the Vice President Doen doesn't know that we've been communicating back and forth with Cameron. Firth, on behalf of McDonald, intervened on multiple occasions when Duff communicated important information with Oswoski that was targeted at the ministerial and deputy ministerial levels. Imagine that you are a young entrepreneur. You've been promised by your contact that the sky is the limit. Here's the question. Your concept, your technology can be implemented across the entire government of Canada because he knows the man. The man works together with your contact to create magic. The man who has contacts, who knows <laughs> what he wants, the man who owns a chalet, or is it a cabin? <laughs> Okay, I got the stuff there. <laughs> Very nice. Oh, that was a great, a great early backhand there. That's amazing. Um, so for those that don't know um, what she means by magic, there was a there was an email from Cameron McDonald to the Bottler folks, um, and what that email said is is basically let Cameron let Christian work his magic meaning Christian from GC strategies um, and the conservatives are trying to figure out what that magic was <laughs> but uh, um, that backhand comment about the chalet slash cabin is great and and you can you can see Brock's hand <laughs> 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 he's just like i'm still trying to figure this out everybody <laughs> um but uh this is great stephanie is is knocking it out of the park here good for her picture now that you enter into what you thought was a contract you'll work hand in hand to create your idea across government and what do you have to worry about it's the government of canada but suddenly things start to go wrong you complete some work you complete some more work, but you don't get paid. So you inquire, you do a little digging and you're concerned by what you find. So what do you do? You do the right thing. You file a complaint because when you file a complaint, it will be taken seriously. It will go through the right channels and it will be addressed because it's the government of Canada or will it? <clears throat> so Mr. Tanu, what did you do when you received the first misconduct report? Okay. Well, that's quite the preamble to the first question of Mr. Utano. And as we expected, this is why he was brought to committee. What did you do with the complaint? That's the magic question that I guarantee you has been on the conservative's mind ever since Spotler made that allegation. Um, do you want to do that? And we want to say thank you to Jarja with a $5 super chat. Uh, it's not the $54 million that bothers me so much. It's the likely tens of billions we don't even know about. Yeah, exactly. I think, what was it, Cypher, that they had done almost half a billion dollars? Like, And by they, I mean GC Strategies, Dalian, and Cordex have done about half a, half a billion with a B uh, in work for the government over the last eight or 12 years, I believe. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of money that we just, we don't know about. And I'm hoping, just hoping that once committee is finished with getting to the bottom of the arrive can app, that they'll go digging and, and get justice for the rest of this money that's been missing. So, um, one of the things that I also wanted to, to say, is um, uh, we've been um, we've been provided with a copy of the first misconduct report that Butler sent to the government, and 
Mr. Utano tried to pass this off as like almost like a two sentence email. This is a basically a, a two and a half page, like full page email. That's going to be more than, hey, um, we want to get paid and what's going on with this Dalian and, uh, <laughs> and GC Strategies relationship. So um, that this is very, very interesting. Um, and um, I don't know if we'll have time to get through it today, but um, we will be referring to this testimony today as we go through this. Um, it's hot off the press. Um, and this, uh, this also contains the full misconduct report. So, um, this is going to be very interesting. So it's, it's great that we have this. Uh, I can't wait to, to go through it. And like, it literally just came into my lap, like literally just now. So, <laughs> um, so, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go through this tomorrow and, uh, and stay tuned because that'll be a recorded video. Um, and I appreciate, very much appreciate the person who, who gave that to me. So thank you. Thank you very much. And we're also 60 likes behind. So please give us a thumbs up. It helps tell YouTube that people need to see this video. Okay, let's go. Thank you for the question. Mr. Chair, the email from Ms. Dutt on September 27th was not a report, but rather an email. And it raised two issues, as I indicated in my opening statement. One is a, was a delayed payment matter, and this, the other one was a concern about Butler's relationship with their partnership between GCS, Dalia Products, and Butler AI. Nothing more. There were no allegations. I've actually provided the email in this package for reference. In fact, I was aware of the email when it first came in and knew that my team was addressing it. And within 24 hours, we successfully resolved the issues. So much so that Ms. Dutt sent, excuse me, Ms. Dutt sent a follow-up email which I also included in this package the next day expressing her gratitude and giving the nature of the email and the prompt resolution it wasn't necessary to forward it to my superiors or Ms. or Gorman. Then why Mr. Utano is Ms. Dutt saying otherwise now that this was the first instance of her submitting that that uh, misconduct report in September of 2021 which which apparently you turned a blind eye to. So first I'd like to address the turning the blind eye. That's not true. The facts are. Did, right did here you in escalate briefings. it when you received that report? Did you did you bring it to the attention so to this to the uh, senior office? Pardon me, to the uh, vice president, based upon the the uh, procedure as outlined in in the senior office of internal disclosure. We aha, uh -huh. there you go. You know the crappy thing about government process is there's so much process. The great thing about government process is it's easy to catch people if they don't follow it because they refer to it. So this is this is really good angle by by Stephanie. You Utano is he's actually doing a very good job of trying to weasel his way out of this. But the conservatives have all of this context, they know what happened, they have the facts and they are not letting this go. We are basically out of time unless you have a very quick yes or no. We'll have to get back to it. There were no allegations in the email. Thank you, Mr. Utano. Wow. Mr. Shawari, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Mr. McDonald, as a Director General of BTID, can you explain very briefly what is your role or what was your role? As Mr. Chair, the, the role, do I have to click the button? The, no, you're the, okay. The role had uh, recently been created. Uh, there was a reorg in uh, the IT branch, and they decided to go through with the reorg during the pandemic. Essentially, I had the responsibility for cloud functions. I had the responsibility for the mobile center of excellence. I had the responsibility for a prototype uh, and innovation section, and I had enterprise architecture amongst us. Uh, did others. that role entitle, uh, entitle the you meeting with vendors yes but definitely part of my role cbsa is a mainframe shop it's very old technology and i was required to meet with vendors for new technologies can you tell me when was the first time you met with gc strategy uh 
the first time I ever met GC, well, GC Strategies, the first time would be almost uh, 2019, late 2018, possibly uh, early 2019. Circumstances around that meeting. Uh, Mr. Firth would have requested a meeting to talk about my business priorities and see what work was going on. I also, uh, Mr. Firth would send different packages of partnerships that he had been fostering throughout uh, private sector. Seems you had a relationship with GC Strategies. I had no relationship, okay, Mr. So Chair. It seemed there was a communication, there was open communication between your office and GC Strategies partner around the fact that they could come visit you and ask you what your priorities are and they share what it is. I'm very surprised. I am very surprised. Juari is actually asking a proper question. What's going on? Sousa must be losing his mind. <laughs> <laughs> Charles Sousa, the guy who is actually, you know, trying to, to fix all of this for the liberals. I, I, it's like Juari isn't invited to the town meetings for that because he's actually, he's actually asking a good question here saying okay so you know you so you had a relationship with oh i didn't have a relationship but sir you're saying that you communicate often with christian christian comes to you and says hey i have some new partners that's called a relationship i don't i like <laughs> i've never heard of executives that have other than cold calls random vendors coming to them and saying Hey, um, hi, I'm from GC Strategies. We, we may, we've worked on one or two contracts. I just want to let you know that I've made some relationships with some vendors and what's your work so we can figure out a way to actually get some more contracts from you. Most people, unless they have a relationship with that person, will say, get lost. I'm busy. I have things to do. I mean, half the time you're so busy, you don't even have the time to respond and, and tell them where to go, you know? Well, that's it. And yes, Tamil, Charles Souza. Yeah. Um, so the fact that, that Juari is like, well, no, no, it sounds like you have a relationship because you have this guy coming to you. So I will give kudos to, uh, to Mr. Juari on the liberal team. And we have a five dollar super chat from Matthew Gallagher. The way these guys oh sorry, I lost it. The way these guys meander in circles gives me a migraine. I am so grateful for the conservative persistence in demanding the truth. Absolutely. So um and due to the fact that they're gonna be referencing this complaint a lot, um I'm just gonna read it, uh read a little bit of it. There's a lot, but I'm just gonna read a little bit. Um, so it says, I, uh, so this is to Mr. Uh, Mr. Utano. Hi, Tony. It's been for forever. I hope you've been well, a little late, but still uh, just as relevant. Um, I wish I was connecting under better circumstances due to ongoing issues with the supplier Dalian Enterprises Inc. in joint venture with Cordex Technology Consulting and their subcontractor GC Strategies Incorporated. Botler AI no longer feels comfortable working or associating with any of the above mentioned parties in any capacity moving forward. We were approached by Christian Firth of GC Strategies in early November 2019, who informed us that his client, the CBSA, asked him to reach out to us regarding starting a proof of concept after confirming that GCS did have business with the agency on buy and sell. Butler began initial groundwork and monetary investment for the project from November 2019 onward. The contract for the project was finalized between the agency and Dalian in 20, January of 2021 and has been riddled with issues that have been flagged repeatedly by Butler's team as well as teams within the CBSA since. From the outset in 2019, we were informed that GCS would be the supplier of the vehicle, would act as the intermediary between Butler and the agency, for which they would charge an additional percentage fee on top of their quoted fees of $350,000 applicable taxes of the proof of concept pilot. In late 2020, GCS informed us that the contract would have to pass another company that he knew. So this goes on. But already... That sounds like some allegations to me. That sounds like allegations of there's some weird stuff going on. And I'm not even halfway through the complaint. Okay, so keep all of that in mind as, as we go through these questions, because this is one of the primary reasons Utano is here, is this complaint. 
Mr. Chair, I met with IBM. I met with Microsoft. Yeah, I I'm not interested it. on those. I'm interested yes, in GC I, I strategy. Had, I had open interactions Thank with you. many vendors. Okay. Um, uh, can you tell me when was uh, uh, when when your similar interaction started with Dalian and Cordex? Uh, around August 2019, uh, Coradex won a fair and competitive uh, contract. And that was the first time that you had an interaction with them. I, I may have added uh, interactions throughout my career with Dalian and Karatex, uh, but there was no no business that I'm aware what of. What was your role in uh, the 20, uh, I believe, $21.1 million open contract that was given to Dalian and Cortex? I was just the director general. There was a procurement team and a technology team that would have done all of the requirements and assessment and worked with our procurement team at CBSA. Who Did you recommend Dalian and Cortex, Cortex to the HR or to... CBS no, say, no I, I have no role that's in the fine. procurement. Uh, what was your, when, when did you become aware of Butler AI? Uh, Christian Firth sent me an email about Butler AI on November the 19th. Okay. It was a proposal that he submitted, jointly branded, with a proposal in yeah. it to do a pilot. Thank you. Is it customary for you to receive or any department to receive unsolicited all the proposal. time. Mr. Chair, we receive unsolicited proposals from the private sector all of the time. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Firth uh, and GC Strategies in particular, uh, I would say six a year I would get them, okay. but we get them from all types of vendors. So can you tell me pandemic, how would GC Strategies uh, know that, well, I assume they, they followed and they know about uh, C65, but how would they know to put a proposal, unsolicited proposal uh, to you for the uh, AI application? I believe Mr. Firth was meeting with multiple departments. C65 was coming down across the entire government. Uh, I received an unsolicited proposal. My understanding is that they went to like nine different departments and did the same thing. I couldn't tell you. <laughs> well, isn't that convenient that you're changing the timeline there? They went to nine different departments after they secured you guys as the pilot. How else would they be able to go to those other nine different departments? Like, dude, you're, <laughs> okay, you want to go down this path, that's fine. And we have a 699 super chat from Johnny O. It says, Butler had mentioned that the emails were being hacked and deleted. This shocked me at the time, but I haven't heard anything since. Ideas? Um, I, I imagine that it's hard to prove a negative. So how do you prove that someone went in and deleted your emails? Now, I don't doubt that it happened. I very much believe that this did happen as reported by Botler. Um, but just because you believe something doesn't mean you can prove it. And um, things like committee and courtrooms have a different level of, of proof than, than you would in, say, casual conversation. So I, I imagine, uh, and this is just a guess, this isn't, you know, necessarily what's happening. But I imagine that um, this may be something that is difficult to prove. And that's why we haven't heard anything else about it, because they're trying to do the work in the background to, to figure out, okay, how do we prove this in committee? Like, how do we provide tangible evidence? Or they may have already proved it, right? They may have already proved all of this and the committee has all of the information. And remember, there's, there's reasons why they're asking these questions, right? So, but... Um, who knows? Like, like Fox, Fox may be right. Like, there's, there, there may be, there's probably a lot more work going on. I, 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 I would agree. So. And also, uh, thank you to Humble Tracker with ten gifted Northern Perspective memberships. Thank you so much. And if you've received a membership, please show some love to Humble Tracker. Don't forget to thank her. Okay. Did you got? Did you at any time guide? GC strategies or uh, Butler AI partners uh, in how to prepare for the presentation uh, to or be careful here, Cameron. At any time, a real time basis as they were prepare as they were presenting these uh, these. Uh, I dare Mr. to say Chair, no. I, I provided some evidence. I, I have a bilateral note from a meeting with my boss where I was told to meet with Butler. And I was told to prepare them for an executive ready presentation. What does prepare them means to you, sir? It means they should have an understanding of the CBSA. They should have an understanding of the government context. They should understand what the business problem is that the CBSA is trying to solve. And at the time when they were presenting, they did multiple presentations. On December the 6th, I was not there for the VP presentation. Min Doan told this committee that he did not follow up and he did not write to Christian Firth, but he did. And I can submit that email in writing to the committee. 
Okay, here comes the buses. <laughs> so, as we as as we hinted at before, or as we surmised before, because you guys were asking, are are these people all coordinating together? And we thought, no, that's probably not happening. And it sounds like Mindone's on his own. Well, now we know he is definitely, definitely on his own, because. McDonald just backed the bus up right over him. So this is actually going to get very interesting, everybody, because there's there's no forethought here. Um, these guys are being clever, but I don't think there's forethought. I don't think they seem to understand that this is going to be Lord of the Flies very, very quickly. Everyone is going to start pointing fingers at each other, and this is going to blow up. This is going to blow up. Guaranteed. This is a mess. Okay. And we have a $10 super chat from Humble Tracker. Can't stay long. Very bad connection. Cheers and thanks. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you very much, Humble Tracker. We appreciate it. Okay. But after that, he told me that they were very green that they presented themselves well, but they were long and they didn't present their technology. Okay. He had a problem with that. And I have Fair emails enough. that I've submitted to Did you at any time uh, guide either GC strategy or um, Butler uh, to in any way uh, embellish their resume to fit the profile that we, we've no. heard that repeatedly that their resume was embellished and GC strategy has acknowledged that uh, was it at any time that you directly or indirectly communicated to GC strategy that we want uh, Butler AI and if their resume fits, the job is, uh, is theirs? No, in no time did that ever happen, sir. Okay. So if that did happen, and if Cameron and Christian were smart, they would not have done that over email. If they were smart. Now, the interesting thing is, is I go back to something I actually believe Christian Firth on. And it, and, but he didn't say it. Butler had, uh, had provided this. That he said that everybody has dirt on everybody else. I believe that. I really do. And I'm hoping, I'm hoping Christian has something in his back pocket. Because again, Christian is, he's window dressing. Right? He's... He's just the tip of the iceberg. He is a crook. He's a liar. Based on everything that we've heard him say. That's what seems to be the case. But he's just the tip of this. So I'm hoping he actually has some emails in his back pocket that he can come back and say, yeah, all that crap that Cameron and Utano said, here's a bunch of stuff. Get off my back. Uh, th this is probably where this whole thing is going to go. And thank you to Office Girl with a $5 super chat. Thanks again for taking the time to cover this mess and provide some insight. You are quite welcome. Um, what is what is a general IT supply and service agreement with Dalian and Cordex? Yeah, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. At CBSA, they had what was called omnibus contracts. So the reason why it was $21 million is it was supposed to last four or five years. Uh, we, Antonio and I, started uh, within about six months of each other. We were borrowing other people's contracts to get work done that when we needed it. So we put in place our own contract. It was supposed to last four or five years. Dalian ended up winning that competition competitively. It was out on the street for vendors to bid on. Um, and, and that's why that contract was around. Thank you. But you're not allowed to do that. Like you can move budget around, but you can't. That's I'd, I'd have to understand more of what he's talking about. Mr. McDonald, uh, Mrs. Uh, Magnola, please. Yes, beaucoup, Mr. Thank you very much, Chair. Mr. McDonald, in your opening remarks, you said you would have preferred Deloitte that was already doing business for the government of Canada in terms of procurement. In the email, 
written to Mr. Duan. In the month of November 2023, you wrote that you found a Montreal-based company and you'd contacted GC Strategies to assess the options and go forward. My understanding is that subsequent to Mr. First's emails that you made a sales pitch to Butler or did you find Butler and Mr. Mr. Chair, I was not there in 2023. I was already at Health Canada. When I wrote the email to Mindong, it was because I'd been asked for help for his attendance at this committee uh, a year previously. On October the 27th, 2023, a member of his inner circle called in me. And m'a appelé pour dire que Kelly Belanger et... called me to what? say that Kelly Belanger and Mindong had been discussing to, that they'd say the country that had been my decision to choose GC strategies. August 28th, 2023, I got a call from Mindong, and he said that Minister Mendocino wanted somebody's head on a plate and said. He didn't know if it would be the CFO, Mr. Moore, or him, the CIO of the department. And then he, he said he would say it was me to the committee. And I said it was not my decision. I had not taken the decision. That I had put two options in front of him, and I would answer if he said such a thing to the committee, Mr. Dung fell ill and did not appear before the committee. The, the Monday morning, I said to my former supervisor, Nancy Hamzawi, that I had been threatened. Sorry, I don't know the word in French. She said, I should tell this to my supervisor. Tuesday morning, I said to my supervisor, and at that time, it was the associate deputy minister, Heather Jeffries. Heather Jeffries called the CBSA to say that I had been threatened. And she met with me afterwards and told me I should not talk to CBSA nor to Mindong because of what was going on, that CBSA was aware of what was going on and that I should uh, withdraw and stand alone. And that's what I did. So the fact that there was two weeks when Mr. Mindong told this committee that he had not played any role in the decision making, you said he's wrong. He was the one who had imposed GC strategies. You wanted Deloitte. That was a lie uh, said to the committee. Everyone knows. We have a team in back of us. It was his decision to take, not mine. I can also confirm with other people, because when he took the decision that Deloitte w wouldn't be it, he said it was because the president said nobody can work with Deloitte because of a project called CARN, which wasn't going well. So the evening he made the decision, I called the, the Deloitte partner to explain he had, they had not been chosen because of problems with CARN. That evening, he told me that my colleague, Sandy Kiriskakis, who is the main lead for data at CBSA, had said the same thing. He, she had wanted to go with Deloitte, too. Okay, so there's a lot there. Um, so he's continuing his attack on Mindon. He's saying, basically, he was being threatened. He was being harassed. The irony here, people, is Butler was brought in to address Bill C-65, which is the government's anti-harassment um, legislation. And this guy is alleging that he was, you know, being harassed or threatened. Um, and he's saying that this is, you know, Mindon. And Mindon is, is trying to throw everybody else under, under the bus and saying he didn't make the decision. All right. Sure. Um now, the interesting thing is, is Cameron being a director general, that's not an insignificant position. And if there was a, if there was another project going on in CBSA, like something called CARM, which by the way, is a $317 million project, $317 million. 
and it's around their ERP system. We're going to get that to, to that in in a couple of days, but a project that huge and that's been going on for years. Cameron McDonald would have known about that. So I find it interesting that the two vendors that were put forth to Mindone was one vendor that would have been disqualified from the outset and GC Strategies, which is run by Christian Firth, which is a longtime buddy of Cameron McDonald. Don't you find that a little coincidental that the two vendors put in front of the CIO to make a decision on one of them had no possibility of actually making it and would have been disqualified. So yeah, that's a little suspicious. If you already know ahead of time that they would be disqualified, you wouldn't be presenting them to the CIO. It's so, almost like you're forcing the CIO to pick a particular vendor. So ERP is electronic revenue and procurement. That's basically your financial system. So that's where you, you house all of your profits, all of your expenses, payroll, you know, that sort of thing. That's, that's what an ERP system is. Um, every organization has them and uh, allegedly this is what was going on. And there's a $317 million allocation for the CBSA to work on this. But that's another dog's breakfast. $317 million. And we have a $5 super chat from Jer Savoy. Want to say Cypher and Fox, you're great. Thank you for all the work, but can't watch tonight. Six hour drive tomorrow, four to five hour on site. Very long day. Well, thank you for joining us and uh, get some rest and have a good day at work tomorrow. So, um, and we also are just a couple likes behind. So please, if you haven't hit the thumbs up, do that for us right now. Anyhow, so... Yeah, there's. I'm I'm willing to bet that that's what happened. Um, but it's very bizarre. It's it's very bizarre that Mindone would would lie about that unless he knew there that it was problematic to be connected with this. So this is very interesting. Very very interesting. You have these two guys who control what vendors, because here's the other thing. A CIO isn't sitting there in vendor meetings. They're a decision maker. The people below them, they're the ones that actually review all of the vendors. And that's the case with every department. So they would look at the vendors, they would look at the requirements, they would evaluate the vendors against what requirements they need, and then say, yeah, you and you, you are gonna be sufficient. They're the ones that actually chose the vendors. Let's be real here. They put them in front of Mindone, probably knowing that Deloitte would have been disqualified. And then they know which vendor would have been would have been coming back. So they knew. So there you go. In your email of November 19, well, in Christian Firth's email, actually, which he sent to you 19 November 2019, he calls you by your first name. Is it because he already knew you? And if so, where had you had contacts before 2019? I had contacts with Mr. First in 29. I had not been in contact with him from 2009 until around 2018, 2019. That's the first thing. The second thing, almost everyone calls me Cam or Cameron. That's normal. I'm someone rather informal with not just him, but everyone. Everyone calls me Cam. Give me a break. Come on. Come on. According to you, you worked with this guy on what project in 2009 and he's calling you Cam? Come on. This is the difference between Cam, Cameron, and uh, Cottage and Chalet, I think. Bernadette Zelensky says, Cam the scam. Yeah. <laughs> Arrive Cam. There Arrive you go. Arrive Cam, yeah. 
in your opening remarks, you said that you had not participated in the review of the decision on GC strategies. Who did participate? Mr. Lutano was the uh, team leader, and he had a director uh, for cloud, also a manager from the mobile expertise center, and there must have been some five or eight other technicians and developers who conducted the analysis of products or companies or solutions that might be implemented. And the final solution to go with GC Strategies was Mr. Dong who took that decision? Yes, he took the decision to go with GC Strategies. He gave me the permission to leave to develop the solution. He knew that there were only two in the five days we had to uh, make the decision. If he had not wanted to go with that decision, he could have asked for a time. Mr. Jones, please. Yeah, well, thank you very much um, for both of you for your testimony. You know, I just want to be clear from the outset, uh, this committee is not trying to destroy anybody's uh, career, especially hardworking public servants. But we need to get to the bottom of this, and we want to make sure that situations like this don't occur again. Now, Mr. Frith acknowledged that he mistakenly sent the Cortex uh, to, well, he said Cortex, the wrong versions of MISDOT and Mr. More of CVs, in which he inflated their experience. Mr. McDonald, he said he went and did a back and forth. Was it a back and forth with you before he altered the, the resumes? <laughs> yeah, no, you guys, you guys already know the answer to this, but uh, I, I know why they're asking it. Um, and um, to, to the question, yeah, Mendocino's name was brought up um, during that last uh, that last exchange, uh, saying something effective. You know, I, I want somebody's head on a platter for this, uh, and it was either going to be Mindone or Cameron McDonald. And allegedly, Mindone was going to say, "Well, you know, I'm going to say that it was Cameron's decision in committee," um, and. Cameron was saying, well, you know, it wasn't my decision, it was his decision. So that's that's kind of where that, that came from. Um, we weren't given too much context on it, so I'm hoping we're gonna get some more, some more later. Never, Mr. Chair, as the DG, I don't deal with any of the okay. CVs or security clearances. It's done by a procurement team. Well, I appreciate that. Cortex submitted these documents, this, this altered resume, which Mr. Frith admitted to, to Public Services and Procurement Canada, and subsequently he received a, a task authorization to deliver uh, Bos Butler software. To this extent that you're aware, would Ms. Dutt and Ms. Mr. Mora have been eligible to perform work for this task authorization had Mr. Frith not inflated their experience? And I'm giving Mr. McDonald that you know the alterations now that you've been following the committee and what took place. Very good question, Mr. Johns. And he points out the fact that, well, it's evident that you've been following the committee because you're saying there's all of these allegations that have been uh, put out there and it's destroying your career, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So given that you have been following that, would they have been disqualified? And he's, Cameron's going to come back and probably say, well, I don't know. That's, uh, that's something to do with Procurement Services Canada and, and I don't know their requirements. If he's smart, he'll say that. I, I'm not aware of the particulars of the contract. I've been following these meetings, obviously. Well, they had seven years work experience and suddenly uh, it was inflated to, to Mr. Uh, Chair, you know, I don't believe years. that they would have qualified let, let me, under the Sorry, let me, just send, let me just pause. Okay. And I've got your time paused, uh, Mr. Uh, Johns. We have apparently bells ringing right now, unfortunately. Oh. Um, I assume we have 25 minutes. Can we, our Not members, can we? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to double check, but if it is, can we have... Uh, Agreement to continue for uh, till five minutes before vote time. Thanks. Hmm? Oh, good Lord. Thank you very so much. I'll, I'll go back to you, Mr. McDonald. Yeah, I've got your time uh, restarted, Mr. Johnson. Don't worry. Good. Great. Um, so, you know, w would they have been eligible to perform the work for the task authorization given, you know, um, if they had revealed their, the, the true experience that they put on their resume and sent once to Mr. Frith? I don't Frith. believe so under the categories that Mr. Firth presented them in. I, I don't validate that. That would have gone through PSPC. It would have gone through CBSA procurement. Okay, so it's problematic that he, he, he kind of knew. I don't, 
He should have I just said I don't know. I didn't see the CVs. I've never seen okay. the CVs. Okay. What, what, what gaps does this reveal in the process? Just trying to fix things. Wait. Did he just slip up there? So first he said, I didn't see the contract. Then he said, they probably wouldn't be eligible. And then he said, I didn't see the CVs. I didn't see the resumes. Well, if you didn't see the contract, you didn't see the resumes, how can you possibly say they probably wouldn't be eligible? That means you knew what the contract was. That means you did know what the requirements were per PSPC policies, and that means you saw the, the, uh, the resumes. That may have been a slip up there, folks. Sure, moving forward. Yeah, I, I guess like when I think about this from a technology standpoint and a user of contracts, I would think that some of the gaps that may exist would be what Mr. Wood brought up, that if you don't have the people attest to their CVs when they're submitted, then it is possible that something could be done in between their submission from okay. Okay. themselves to what about the, the government there, of Canada. Do you believe CBSA as a, as a purchasing organization responsible for ass assessing, you know, the, the contract securities programs finding should have a role in uh, that? So the CBSA would have gotten this from PSPC. My understanding is that the CBSA does a secondary security check. Uh, they, they don't just take what uh, PSPC gives them, so I don't think CBSA would have had any responsibilities in that regard. You know, come on, man. Give me a break. If you're getting a, a, a vendor that is bringing you people to work on a project that your organization is going to be accountable for delivering, you're not going to look at the resumes of the people. Are you seriously sitting there and suggesting that? Give me a break. Give me a freaking break. You are absolutely going to screen those people. Why? Because these people are going to be delivering on a contract that you are going to be accountable for shelling out money for. Unless what you're suggesting is you don't look at the experience and you just leave it up to Procurement uh, Services uh, Canada? PSPC? Really? I don't buy it for a second, Cam, now that we know each other. <laughs> Okay, given what you're hearing, and you've heard Mr. Frist's testimony last week, I assume that you heard that on Thursday? Yes, sir. Yeah, so that he's admitted to altering the resumes. You're quoted as saying, let Mr. Frith, let, uh, let uh, Kirsten uh, do his magic in an email. Would you not send an email like that, knowingly uh, that he's altered resumes? in a situation like this? M Mr. Chair, I, I don't believe I sent that in an email at all. I believe I read that for the first time in an article that was written okay. that, that was written poorly. Uh, okay. I, you know you might not be able to see this, Mr. Johns, but I took that article. I couldn't sleep. Okay. And I read out every single timeline that that man quoted. If he thinks he's making himself look smart, it's having the exact opposite effect. He looks kind of like a lunatic who's just like, ah, oh, you've all seen the meme where that guy's pointing on the on the billboard and there's like a bazillion strings facing like in all different directions. And the guy's like, look at this, look at this. I'm sorry. I'm taking a screenshot of this because this is the most ridiculous thing I have <laughs> ever seen come out of committee. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Oh man, the only thing he's missing is a tinfoil hat. But here, here's the funny thing. Like just, just on the surface, and, and this is just the comedy aspect of this. Look at this guy holding this up, right? He's holding this up. It looks like a 12-year-old put this together. And right before he holds this up, he says, it was a poorly written article. <laughs> Yet this is what you brought to committee for evidence. Are you kidding? Like, what? To be fair, I believe that we had made the uh, the con or like we had made the observation that the Globe article was quite difficult to follow. It was but, a poorly written article. But there was so much information in it. There and, was, and that was part of the problem. Like, if you're just a casual reader, it was it was a lot to chew on. You know what I mean? But there was so much good information in there. 
Yeah, um, and I, uh, I, it's, it's a problem because he was quoted in that article regard to the magic quote. So if he's going to deny that he said that, that's going to be a problem for him. Anyway, um, let's, let's watch and present his paint by number uh, picture here. And okay. represented it. And I just want to say to people... The CBSA did not, I'll stay here all day, Mr. Johns, so you don't need to worry about your time. We can give everybody six more minutes, okay? No, it, it doesn't we, work like we that. We sat here, yeah. it was post-pandemic when we did any contracting at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, that was very, very significant what he just said. So what he's trying to do, he is actually trying to take time to tell his story so the narrative is carried across the way he wants. He doesn't want to answer questions. He wants to tell his story. And, the, and he's deciding. He's deciding that committee gets to to go on for like another two hours. Um, no, buddy, you don't get to tell your story. You need, you need to shut up and answer the questions that the committee asks you. That's, that's how this works. You don't get to come in here and tell the committee how, how this works. I'm starting to understand right from how he's operating right here. I'm starting to understand the dynamic between him and Christian Firth. It was suggested to us that it's possible that Christian is afraid of Cameron. Cam, sorry, bud. And it's because this guy... He seems to like telling other people what to do, and he seems to get really agitated when he doesn't get to do what he wants. So this is very interesting. Keep, keep an eye on his, on the way he is actually responding to the types of questions he's asking everybody, because his the way he's responding is almost as important as what he's responding with. When I was supposedly said that was February 2019 before the pandemic. I was talking about them being in a partnership, introduced to me as being in partnership and navigating through the complexity. Oh, you need a tissue? I wasn't talking about anything nefarious. I wasn't talking about anything no, bad. And I, I don't I don't I don't want to do that to you right now. I'm trying to fix this and and and, how, and I'm really glad that you're getting a chance to to tell your side of the story. Now, Ms. O'Gorman she just wrote a letter to this committee. She's asked PSPC to temporarily suspend all CBSA contracts with GC Strategies, Cordex, Dalian. This is pretty serious. Would you agree that the CBSA wouldn't, would be sending a letter like this um, if it wasn't serious, if there wasn't concerns, real concerns that are being brought forward here? And I, I'm, I'm not talking about your involvement. There has to be some substantial concerns. Do you not agree for Mr. Ms. O'Gorman to write this letter? Mr. So that's a, that's a piece of news if you didn't hear. Uh, it's very, very significant. Um, so it was reported today, I believe, in the National Post. Um, I'm going to fact check myself on that. Uh, sorry, Globe and Mail. Uh, I was reporting the Globe and Mail today that... Um, CBSA suspended all contracts with Dalian, Cordex, and GC Strategies. You mean they haven't up until this point? They haven't up until this point. That's surprising. Right. Now, it's... You wonder, is this because of what's happening in committee? Or is this because what's happening with the RCMP in the background that we don't have, you know, visibility to? Or is it because of both? The hope, I think, that everybody hearing this has is because it's both and not just because of what's happening at committee so we'll see president i guess the only question i would say is what has cbsa learned in the last two weeks that they didn't already know the cbsa had the email from september 27th that had no allegations it wasn't a report of wrongdoing Incorrect. whatsoever they they sat here at this committee and didn't defend mr utano or myself Okay. Uh, well, I would think the CBSA should speak yeah. for themselves. Uh, sorry, that okay. is our time, uh, Mr. Johns, perhaps in your next round. Mr. Uh, Brock, for five minutes, please. Oh, no. 
Oh no! Okay. If, if we thought that McDonald's was gonna cry before, he's definitely gonna cry now. Well, we'll see. We'll see. All right, I'm just I'm, I'm getting ready. I'm getting ready. <laughs> I'm getting ready. Okay. I see everybody's getting psyched up in the chat. All right, here we go. Hopefully we're we're not we're not psyching ourselves up for for something that. Uh, that doesn't happen, but let's let's bring on the Brock. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so uh, to, to both uh, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Utano, although you've not been uh, sworn to tell the truth, <laughs> here we uh, go. When you attend a committee, the parliament part of parliamentary privilege, there's a component that you are required to tell the truth. You are required to give us fulsome answers. So I just wanted to put that on the record because I know you have legal counsel present. Uh, both of you have independent legal oh. counsel, is that correct? We have, the, we have legal counsel. Yes. Same, is same. it from the DOJ or, or no, is it not private counsel? We weren't provided no. with any support from the federal government when this happened whatsoever, so okay. we had to go get our own support. It, that was probably a oh, very wise move on your part because <laughs> not only is the Auditor General expanding her review, which started off as a Rive Can, but because of the story from the Globe and Mail in early October, uh, her concerns about the same players and the same government agencies, she's expanded that uh, review. But more importantly, the RCMP are investigating, not a Rive can, they are investigating the CBSA, all the employees, all the executives, including both you, Mr. McDonald, and you, you Mr. Utano, as well as other government agencies. The three companies at, at issue right now, GC Strategy, Strat Strategies, Dalian, and Coridex, and as to what truly transpired as to whether or not there was some criminality, all right? So I can understand why you'd want to have counsel. So putting that aside. <laughs> putting that aside. Wow. <laughs> um, the, the interesting thing is, is I've never heard Brock say this to anybody when they he didn't know they were lying i've never heard him say that to anybody that he did not know they were lying from the outset he's already answered some questions right so this is interesting and you know the fact that the fact that camera's saying well the government didn't provide any support why would they why would any employer provide you support yeah, haven't you taken enough money from the government? Right? Like, get out of here. Like, if, if you were investigated and called into a hearing because of potential misconduct at a private organization, do you think that same private organization is going to offer you a lawyer and pay for it? What's wrong with you? That is asinine that you would, you know, cry about that. And it's kind of flippant for me to say, but I'm sorry, that's just ridiculous. Uh, Matthew Galvagan with a $2 super chat. Cam San, uh, sorry, Cam sounds like a whining child who got busted. Absolutely. 100%. Well, he seems that whine, like that whining bully who got busted, right? It's like, it's like you've seen that movie where, not a particular movie, but there's a movie where where you know the there's this one kid and he's like picking on other kids, and then the teacher walks in the room and then he turns into like oh my god I don't you know stop picking on me, he 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 sounds like that guy. You uh, both in your opening statements, you were very quick to uh, impugn the in, the uh, credibility of oh, the whistleblowers. I, I call them the whistleblowers, the same brave. Page two entrepreneurs from Bottler AI, and you were prepared to actually throw under the bus the press, and particularly the Globe and Mail. So I just want you to, to be aware, sir, because you use the phrase a lot. Well, these are allegations, and I'm here to tell the truth. I'm gonna give you the facts. What you need to be aware of, sir, is that the Globe and Mail that started this investigation analyzed thousands and thousands of pages of documents release pursuant to access to information requests that came from the CBSA. <laughs> we we'll also reviewed extensive documentation compiled by the entrepreneurs themselves, uh -oh. <laughs> including contracting records and audio recordings 
of their conversations with IT consultants and both you, Mr. McDonald, and you, Mr. Utano. So we have hours and hours of conversations that are actually recorded. Okay, I'm going to go back to my statement saying where I said I've never heard him say this to people where he doesn't know they're lying. He knows they're lying. <laughs> yeah, you called it. I mean, I think we all know at this point that these men are obviously lying, but... But nothing is more satisfying than than these corrupt people in government that just think they're they're above everybody else. Yeah, they think they're untouchable. They're, but there's nothing more satisfying than seeing them lie and then getting called out on their lies on camera. Because these these people have been operating with impunity for decades decades stealing our taxpayer money and using it as if it's their own personal bank account so it is so satisfying to see these guys caught out on that thank you to robert mcfallion with a five dollar super chat corruption at border services agency working for a government that considers borders useless and our country a post-national state there you go yeah so in my view, these aren't allegations. This is this is fact. This is evidence. I've, I'm not. I haven't asked you a question yet, sir. Okay. This is my time, and, and this is how I'm going to frame the question ultimately <laughs> to you. So I wanted you to be aware of that, sir. Okay. So when we go back to taking a look at why uh, Butler would would have the need to uh, to record you. Um, it's very, very clear early on when you take a look at all the stories is they thought it extremely unusual that it was the CBSA, you in particular, sir, who sought them out and sought them out not directly by yourself or one of your employees, but rather a middle person, Christian Firth from GC Strategies, because their work previous to this particular engagement was directly with the Department of Justice. They had civil servants. They reached directly out to Bottler. They did the work. They got paid. There was no middleman, no ghost contractor that we like, we like to refer to GC strategies. So that I want to bring to your attention, sir. Now, you also claim that it wasn't you who initiated the concept of of CBSA uh, engaging with Bottler, that it was actually Firth's idea. So, you know Firth testified last week. Firth is on record saying that it wasn't his idea, it was your idea, that you had researched it, and you wanted him to approach uh, Bottler. So, both sets of facts can't be true at the same time. And Brock's trying You're to divide saying something draw completely right opposite. There. So, who's lying to committee? Mr. Firth or yourself? Who? Oh, there you go. That's uh, that's quite the opening question. Very, very surgical by Mr. Brock there. Puts all that context in there. Don't lie to us. We'll know. That's the message. Don't lie to us. You'll be held in contempt. And this information is going to be passed to the Auditor General and the RCMP. And your buddy, buddy, Mr. Firth, basically tried to throw you under the bus last week. So trying to drive a little wedge in there. Very, very, very surgical by Mr. Brock here. And thank you to Lauren and Duncan for a twenty-seven ninety-nine super sticker. First one on a live stream. Thank you. All right. Let's hear the answer. Mr. Chair, I don't believe Mr. First said that, and I think you can check his transcripts. I think Mr. First said that he reached out to Butler after speaking to a number of CIOs around town. He had talked to me and that he had understood that Bill 65 was important. At the time, there were news clips that CBSA had undergone a whole bunch of sexual harassment claims, and that's why I told him it was one of my priorities. I want to bring your attention, since everybody is talking about Thank you. I don't, I don't want to hear I'm about anything else, sir. Because that is your, uh, you that is your time, question. Mr. Brock. Is my time up? 
Your time is up, I'm afraid. Thank you. Mr. Baines, please, for five. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Utano, for joining us today. Um, you said you preferred Deloitte. I wanted to just sort of find out M Mr. Doan's role in all of this process. He talked about, we asked him a question. He said, I have a team that makes a decision. Um, and then I asked how, how many people are part of this team. He said 1,400, so I'm like, or 1,400 people making this decision, or, and then he said, well, there's six directors, and then I think we've asked for uh, some names on who those people are. So, like, you prefer Delo Deloitte, and uh, what was the process used sort of to select GC strategies, and what was Mr. Doan's role in all of that? I can start. Maybe Mr. Utano can help me. They're doing an and, and or the team no, that he they're, mentioned. They're, yeah. they're doing an assessment. There's three or four companies, some of them big, some of them we already worked with, the CBSA. Some of them are outsourced, some of them are in-source. Uh, I see one floating to the top. I'm like, this isn't good. I also see about 100 requests coming in. It's the middle of the pandemic. That's why we were only given five days to do all of the options assessment. HR is coming, commercials coming, travelers is coming. I wanted to bring in some Clydesdales, Deloitte, to be able to help out. I worked in evenings with Deloitte and the partner, and he put in an innovation team, and I told them the same requirements that the technical team had to work with. They came up with a concept, and Mr. Utano and his development team came up with a concept. On March 24th, we, he sent the options for GC strategies, and I sent the option for Deloitte into Mr. Doan. Subsequent to that, I had a meeting with Mr. Doan where he told me that Deloitte was not an option because of CARM. If I could add, can I add, Mr. Chair? Can I add to that? So the, the technical team, the Mobile Center of Excellence, looked at a lot of other options, but the, the theme around it was in search capacity. They wanted to participate in the development. They saw that was a better approach and long term, and so they worked in developing this concept, forwarded it to me, which then I forwarded directly actually to uh, my CIO, Mendon, directly, and, and then left it there for decision and uh, reference. So when you said they, who, who's they? The internal uh, team? Yeah. So we, have a tech, we had a technical team. We had a very small mobile center excellence team who was just getting off the ground and working in mobile. And so, and so when this pandemic hit and Public Health Agency of Canada came to us in urgency requesting this I, I'll call this, this capability for mobile to deal with the contact tracing, we had to look for options. And so we went to our teams and asked them for options. This one surfaced as a viable option. It was based on a few things, more than a few, but security, the ability to provide a secured, uh, protected cloud, the ability to have secured resources, the skill sets, et cetera. What doesn't make sense in what they're saying is that they're they're trying to position this as if a rive can happened in 2020 2021 but that's not when it started that's when a rive can it, it turned into a rive can but there was an app that was being worked on before this and it was for it was basically a Rive Cam, but not the pandemic. It was just a border services app that you would download on your phone. And the intent was, is when it was finished, you'd be able to use it to check in the airport and customs and, and that sort of thing. So, And that started in 2019. So one of the main pieces here that doesn't make sense is that they're trying to act like this all just happened. But from my understanding... That's not how this went down. Extra requirements may have been added when you're talking about vaccine status and like that sort of thing, but not the rest of it. The rest of it would have been in the foundation of the actual application itself. So there's a lot of inconsistencies here. And by the way, somebody uh, just pointed out to me there, so they, they were they were smack talking the the Globe and Mail. Um, 
Bill Curry, who is one of the reporters that actually have, has written a lot of these stories about this, is actually sitting right behind uh, Mr. Utano. <laughs> so I hope he's comfortable. And thank you to Michael Kovacs with a $5 super chat. Love you guys. Look forward to your videos every day. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so when they took that into consideration, a viable option that came to the, to the top, if you will, was this proposal. And so again, I just forwarded it on to the uh, CIO. And then the CIO makes the, then who finally well, at that point, yeah. the CIO would have had two proposals, two viable proposals. We didn't which, just were, look at two. which were? Mr. Deloitte, Mr. Your package, Deloitte. When, you, yes. when everybody gets their packages, they'll see there's a Deloitte proposal that was sent by me. There's a GC Strategies proposal that was sent by Mr. Utano. I had a meeting with Mr. Doan afterwards. Mr. Doan told me that Deloitte was not an option. We talked about the fact that there would need to be a sole source contract. I have an email in my package on March 24th that I sent Mr. Doan letting him know that we would have to talk about methods of supply and suppliers because we didn't have any contracts in place at the time of the pandemic and we would need the resource categories that were outside of what we had within the Dalian contract. We had that discussion. And what and was the was response told, to that? I was told you need to do what you need to do. These are exceptional circumstances. I trust you to get it done. The whole thing was around whether or not we could have a release within a month or not. The other thing that's very strange here is why are two different guys in the same department submitting two different allegedly independent proposals for this thing? That doesn't make sense to me either. Because whenever you see this happen in, in, in organizations, there's a guy that's responsible for that. And these guys aren't grunts. No, these are like highly paid executives. Like they're not, yeah, like they're, they're not low level IT people. So I don't understand this whole scenario that they're putting together that, oh, well, I did all this work with, with Deloitte and this guy did all this work with his internal development team, but somehow that produces a GC strategies quote. Unless he's talking about the internal development team put together the project or the, the, the requirements. And then that just brought in GC strategies. But how would GC strategies even have been brought in? Because it doesn't sound like Utano had any relationship with GC strategies. Remember, Cam? So how would they even get in the door unless you brought them in? I guarantee you this is how it went down. So they are told, okay, hey guys, remember that app that we've kind of been working on and it's not ready yet? Well, um, we need something to actually do contract tracing and vaccine status screening and all this garbage for travelers coming in and out of Canada and across Canada. So you guys need to put together a proposal. So Cameron says, aha, okay. Hey, Utano, this is what we're gonna do. Um, so just so we can kind of avoid what this looks like, I'm gonna go and put something together for Deloitte. And uh, you're gonna work with Cameron and you're gonna make sure that he has all the proper requirements. I'm gonna over, overly inflate all the Deloitte stuff. So they're gonna be automatically disqualified from this. So we're not even gonna worry about that. And then you and I are gonna submit these separate proposals separately. And we know for a fact that Deloitte's gonna be disqualified because I'm gonna make sure they're gonna get disqualified. And then I'm gonna to pretend to be all sad about that. And then we're gonna go with GC strategies at the end of this. That sounds to me how this went down. And the more he talks, the more I'm convinced that's how it went down. Because he is distancing himself so much from GC strategies in here. Well, I was working on Deloitte. I was working, you know, at, I was working late. <laughs> oh, no, an executive who works late? Like, Cry me, me a, a river. Break. Give me a break. Oh, yeah, uh, Rhonda Davey. So, can, uh, so Firth has admitted to Butler... Um, that he's been with Cam since the beginning of his career in government. And I think he said the same thing when he came into committee, didn't he? 
yeah. that, oh, no, it's not that, you know, uh, I've been with him my whole career. It's that I've been with him his whole career, meaning yes. he's been with McDonald's his whole yes. career. Yes. So, anyway. We will see. In your time at CBSA on, on the many projects, did you use GC strategies to source talent, like, um, all the time? You said they brought forward six... At it uh, almost um, uh, so we we use six a year sorry yes Miss, Mr. Chair we used primarily our general IT services contract which was with Dalian our understanding is that Dalian has subcontracted various resources through GC strategies and other companies I think my understanding is that's their modus operandi for the most part of how they work interesting. He just said, Dalian, our understanding is that Dalian has subcontracted various resources through GC strategies. That's more than one, everybody. Recall back to the testimony given by Mr. Wood from Cortex, and he said to the, uh, the question that was asked to him, have you how many times have you worked with GC strategies? And he said, well, we've worked with them on occasion, which also sounds like more than one. Christian Firth said that this was the only time that he's worked with Dalian. So you have Cameron saying resources, multiple resources. You have Wood saying on occasion, and you have Firth saying once. Who's telling the truth? And thank you to Humble Tracker with another five Northern Perspective memberships. If you are a lucky recipient, please thank Humble Tracker. You know, I got to get that Maury clip in here so I can play it whenever somebody <laughs> tells a lie. The lie detector said that was a lie. So there were GC strategies, represented subcontracted resources working, secret cleared within the CBSA when the pandemic hit. They were the ones working with the technical team that helped to develop the GC Strategies proposal. And did you ever encourage Sorry, contractors to that, sir? Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Spignola for two and a half, please. May I ask some comments? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've been listening and I'm trying to understand Aren't how we all? does procurement work and how did it work, not just regarding Butler AI, but Concerning Butler AI, and I think this is the best example I give, you have uh, Dalian Koradix, who are essentially two fellows who find computer technicians, programmers, developers, network architects, and so forth, and they provide those resources to the Government of Canada. Then you have GC Strategies, who do exactly the same thing, they go find uh, experts in IT. Then you have one who uses the other to identify contacts. And every time there's a profile, there's, you know, some, if someone gets a, a minimum, uh, 1 to 15 percent, the other takes a minimum at 15 percent. And so we ended up paying money over money to get employees. Mr. Utano. I mean, I find this absolutely enormous. Mr. Utano, in your role in responsibilities, there, is there nobody in your team who could have been capable of developing an application? Uh, there's n no specialization? And s instead of paying out millions to four guys? The, the, the answer is no. The level of complexity that was developed for the mobile application, and I just want to remind the, the committee that it has progressed to what you see today. It, it started with a, a basic digital form, and we were okay. able to do that internally. It then progressed to pre-border, at-border, post-border, transactional, and holding on to very private information of Merci. travelers to Canada. Don't. Oh, no. You mean an app actually has to do multiple things? But how complex can this app be if someone was able to clone it in a weekend? Well, exactly. Two guys. And it's not like two guys did that together. Two guys did it independently. 
And this guy, I think, Utano made a big mistake because at the beginning of this, he said, while we were in the midst of creating a center of excellence for mobile apps. Well, center of excellence usually means that you're really specialized in it. So if you're in the midst of doing that, then you already had some good people there. So why didn't you just continue to hire good people? And the, the big problem with this is that you're going to need to lean on government resources anyway, because if they're, if they're really serious about the complexity of this and the integration within the government data systems, well, that's going to be all government people doing that. So what are you talking about? This sounds like an inflative pile of garbage that someone got rich on and the charge was to the Canadian taxpayer and that's unacceptable. Thank you. So that capability didn't exist at the time. So did the government be, be you know, take action to fill that void because these applications are essentially the modern day tool and the tool of tomorrow. S I mean, we have to stop being uh, paying out millions to one subcontractor after another. It's our time, though. Perhaps you can say before the next round with uh, Ms. Vignola. Mr. Johns, please, for two and a half. So, um, Mr. Utano, CBSA's policy on internal investigations into alleged or suspected employee misconduct requires you to provide any misconduct reports to your vice president, which, which was uh, Ming Dong. Did you provide the September 27th, 2021 Bottler report to Mr. Dong, internal affairs or any other supervisor? He's going to say, no, I didn't because there was no allegations in there, despite the fact that you heard that there was allegations that I read just a portion of that. Thank you for the question. I'm, I'm gonna say it again. So the email from Ms. Dutt on September 27th that I received was not a report, but rather an email that raised two issues. One was a payment delay, and the second was a concern about Bottler's relationship with their partnership between GCS, Dallin Cratics, and Bottler AI. Nothing more. There were no allegations in that email. In fact, Mr. Johns, I provided the actual email in the package, okay. and if you look to, to tab 23, uh, you'll, you'll see the actual email. Um, and then I was also, I want to just confer, uh, confirm for the committee that I was aware of the email when it came in. I knew that my team was addressing it, and within 24 hours, they successfully, we successfully resolved the issues. So much so that Ms. Dutt sent a follow-up email the next day expressing her gratitude. Given the nature of the... Really? Well, this sounds like an allegation to me. Quote, after repeated requests, we received the attached email entitled FYI from GC Strategies that the value of Bottler's contract had been cut by $16,000 to $336,000 with no explanation provided, as well as the agreement between GCS and Dalian also attached. At no point were we consulted by either Dalian or GC Strategies regarding the terms or any aspect of this contract, and we never provided our consent to the existing terms, which don't even specify our company's name. End quote. You're going to tell me that those are not allegations. Really? I'd love to know your definition of allegations. These guys. And following that, they're talking about the, the response the next day. There was a commitment by Utano to set up a meeting to discuss. But that never happened. Never happened. Why? Because the contract was cancelled. So yeah, I guess you could say it was resolved. What a crock. So, so, and the okay, prompt resolution, so, so it wasn't here, necessary. Here's the thing. To the next day, Ms. Ms. Daly then uh, ordered uh, a payment to Bottler, and, and Bottler got uh, a payment. Can you explain why that happened so quickly? Part of the resolution, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. So part of the resolution was that we reached out to our prime contractor with whom we have the contract with, Dalian Karatics, and reminded them, quite frankly, that when we pay an invoice, we expect them to pay their employees. Mm -hmm. And so that was the resolution. Uh, the Dallin Karatics confirmed that they were going to 
make that payment. They were apologetic, and then okay. the matter was closed. You you put forward in your statement, you didn't get a chance to finish it. You said, I've lost faith in the public service and those who, in a position of authority, had the opportunity to uphold these same values. Yet here at the committee, given the platform to do so, chose not to. Who are you identifying there, and is there anyone that's come forward to testify at this committee that you feel has not been upfront and told the truth? Just a brief answer, please. Yeah, real quick. The opportunity to access the email was there, Mr. Johns. I was just I was disappointed that that the email that September 27th was not accessed and presented at this committee when our when our leadership uh, came here to uh, to speak to the committee. Tano, Mr. Barrett, please for five. Was GC Strategies named in any legal documentation for the work done with Botler, Mr. McDonald? I wouldn't be aware of any of the legal work done that you're referring to, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I apologize. In, in, in the official documentation for the project, was GC Strategies listed? The only official documentation that I am aware of that I had privy to was a task authorization for a feasibility study. There was never mention of a pilot. There was never mention of GC Strategies whatsoever. Was GC so GC Strategies was not named on the task authorization? Neither is Botler, uh, Mr. Chair. But uh, they were subcontractors? No. The, on the task authorization is Dalian Enterprises and Karatex. I am not privy to or aware or provided with any subcontracting arrangements. I am not uh, involved in any of the discussions that take place between third party partnerships. So you and that's by design. That's by design. So I can claim ignorance when I'm called to committee. You would never know that uh, were it not for the public reporting on this, that payment to Botler flowed through GC strategies. I and left GC this. Strategies then took a percentage for, for their... I, I left the CBSA before any of the deliverables or payments would have been made. I wouldn't be aware of how the payment structure or their agreements are uh, anyways. When did you leave? At, on what date did you complete your time at uh, CBSA? I think it was May the 3rd. I got pulled over pretty quickly, and, and I didn't go back to my official records, but it was around May the 3rd that I started at Health Canada. So after... Uh, Botler asked CBSA uh, to stop payments because of misconduct. Uh, Diane Daly of CBSA demanded payments go through GC Strategies. Is that correct? I'm not privy to those emails. I wasn't around. At yes, that that's time, correct. Mr. Okay. Chair. So you've said that uh, you're not friends with Mr. Firth of GC Strategies. Is that correct? That is correct. And you didn't have much to do with him? I didn't. I've met Mr. Firth three times out of an office place in my entire life and it, you see it, it appears that you placed a high amount of trust in him to deliver on a project that you deem to be of exceptionally high importance that's that's the appearance of it why why mr. chair the only thing I can tell you about my experience and the only time I had worked with mr. Firth before Butler was arrive can and I can tell you that the consultants that he brought to the table delivered lie 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 you have to be more careful than that, Cam. The only time that he had worked with GC Strategies before Botler was Arrive Can. Botler was before Arrive Can. What's wrong with you? What's wrong is he's lying and he can't keep his lies straight. Right. This is the problem. Tell the truth. Tell the truth and you don't have to have a good memory. And he also said that he's known him back in 2009. So that means you must have worked with them back in 2009. Doesn't that mean, does, isn't that what that implies, Cam? No? Oh. Okay. And I recognize that not everybody likes the policies of Arrive Can, but we delivered and delivered and delivered. And that year that I was on, we never missed a deliverable once in in fairness i would say you delivered a very expensive price tag to canadians and you delivered a lot of canadians um into quarantine who um did not meet the uh the necessity to have been ordered into quarantine they were illegally detained so those those are also outcomes for for that project as well we've heard one witness who was um caught lying to this committee the committee that was on on full display and we've heard uh, assertions um that there have been others so 
we see that there's, uh, based on the allegations that we've heard from Butler, that there's a network of people not following uh, the, the, the rules, that they're breaking the law. That's why there's an RCMP investigation. Um, and you've pushed yourself uh, quite hard against this so that you're not uh, um, associated with it. Um, I'm very curious about the motives of, um, of everyone involved, about the people who would be lying. And so uh, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. I'd like you to respond as quickly as possible, please. Um, was Mr. Firth honest and truthful in all of his presentation and responses to committee based on uh, what you know? <laughs> oh, good question. Good question. Oh, my God. What a great question. Great question. Okay. Many of you probably already are, already know why it's a great question, but for those that don't, this is why this is such a great question because he's actually he's actively asking Cameron McDonald to impeach or not everything that Christian Firth said, and Christian Firth implicated Cameron McDonald in some things, right? So the answer is yes or no. So if the answer is yes then what he is saying is that everything that Christian first said is true. But they know that a bunch of things that Christian is uh, that Christian said is false. So that means that that a, that Cameron is under that same pretense. This is kind of a no win question. And if he says no, there's a bunch of things that that, that isn't true there then that's going to be problematic for Cameron as well because that signals to to Christian that I'm throwing you under the bus you 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 are on your own and remember Christian's coming back he's coming back to committee and they're going to say so what do you have to say about what Cameron said it's kind of like that good cop bad cop trick that's going on so this is a really really good question No. So he said no. Was Mr. I'm going to circle back to that. Okay. Was Mr. Doan truthful and no. fulsome and honest? Was Mr. Osowski truthful and honest in his presentation to this committee? I couldn't say more than I don't know that he really represented or stuck up for the people that we would have expected him to. Was Miss O'Gorman truthful and fulsome and honest? I wouldn't think so. Whoa. Okay. So everyone's lying. Yeah. Paradoxy. Absolutely. Everyone's lying. I'm the one that's telling the truth. Everyone else is lying. So he is accusing the current president, government appointed, government appointed by Privy Council, government appointed president of the Canadian Border Services Agency of lying to committee is accusing the former president of the Canadian Border Services Agency of lying to committee, is accusing the current chief technology officer of the government of Canada of lying to committee. And this guy, this guy knows all. For the record, I don't think they were all completely truthful, but why does that mean that he, that, Cameron McDonald is. He's the angel? Really? Don't think so. Would you be able to detail for this committee in writing um, the, the areas where they were dishonest and not fulsome in their replies? Yes. Okay. And would you be able to undertake to provide that to the committee in, uh, what's the standard time, Chair? Uh, would you be able to provide it within a couple of days, two days? I believe, uh, Mr. Chair, you'll have a lot of it in my submission already, but I will undertake to do it within 72 hours if that's acceptable. I appreciate that. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Mr. McDonald. Mr. Uh, Kuzmierczuk, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. McDonald, in, in the brief that we had received, um, it states, uh, Butler AI wanted to circumvent the procurement and contracting structure and contract directly with the CBSA. Can you explain that? 
Mr. Yatana would be better to explain oh, it because that okay. happened after I left. Oh, sure. Thank you for that. So here's what I think. Um, if you, if, if we all agree, here's, here's some quick deductions here. If we all agree, and we should, that Mindone knew who selected the contractor. He could have said Cameron McDonald. He didn't. He didn't say his own name, but if he wanted to, if he wanted to offer a head on the chopping block, he could have said Cameron McDonald. He didn't. John Oswowski didn't. John Oswowski would have known who Cameron McDonald was and would have known his role in this, but he didn't. So in a way, they were protecting Cameron in their testimony. Cameron comes on here, has a fit, starts throwing stones at the people that were, uh, that were uh, protecting him. How do you think those people are going to react now? Well, they're all coming back to committee, aren't they? If, if, if I'm one of those people, and even if I'm not being summoned back to committee, I'm emailing committee and say, um, I'd like to add to my statement, please. I would like to add to my previous testimony. That's what I would be doing if I was these other people. Because they were shielding him. And he just cast stones at the people that were shielding him. So why would that shield continue? That's the question. I think Cameron has thought has, has operated like he was the golden boy throughout his career. I think we all know people like that. They think they're they're the gift to whatever organization or company that they're in. Whether they're a cashier, whether they're a director, whether they're a plumber, like it doesn't matter what they are. They think they're just the gift to everybody. And with that comes a huge sense of entitlement. And uh, he's having a tantrum now because he got caught. And Golden Boy isn't being protected anymore. So this is this is gonna this is gonna blow up blow up and no cbc is not covering this hardly anybody is covering this except for the globe and mail and northern perspective and northern perspective the question so i've actually provided those emails those, those subsequent emails after resolution uh, miss dutt had comments in those emails asking if we could uh, engage in a direct contract to which we replied you have to we have to go for a whole new contracting process her um, dissolution or removal from the partnership is totally up to her, but we would have to go to CBSA's contracting and procurement uh, uh, department group to even begin those conversations. They qualify, right? Is that correct as a vendor? So I'm not the procurement expert. I'll be completely honest. Um, since th th there's a separation of roles and responsibilities and duties, I would I would lean to my to the, my procurement yeah, uh, colleagues. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chair, if I could help just the member understand. My understanding is that in quarter three of 2021, at some point, Butler did qualify on an invitation to qualify for AI companies, but that's not a standing offer, and that doesn't mean you qualify to work with the federal government. It means you can qualify for the RFP process. So it would be an invitation to qualify for RFPs. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily make you certified with PSBC for a standing offer for the government just to go give you a contract and do work directly. I thought he didn't understand the PSPC processes, everybody. He understands it when it's convenient to understand it. Indeed. Indeed. This guy loves telling people. He loves correcting people. You can see the arrogance all over his face. He loves educating people. He loves presenting to people. Yeah, as an aside, just watching this guy... It's weird because he's arrogant, but then like when he's pressed too hard in committee, it looks like he wants to cry at the same time. Like I just I can't figure this guy out. Yeah. Um, but here's the thing. 
like I don't buy his explanation here because in order to be a vendor to be selected by the government you have to go through a process you do there's a bunch of stuff I know some people that are vendors um and uh, I know a guy who actually did some work relatively recently, and it was a lot. You have to go through a lot of stuff to to get pre-qualified to be able to to be added to this. And then once you are, you you go on a list, and you can just go click. I want to do business with that vendor. Now, depending on the criteria. There may be some other hoops you have to jump through, but you don't you don't have to do any work, like actual project work to get qualified. But you have to go through this process with all all these forms. I remember the guy telling me he's like this is this is ridiculous. It's like filling out you know my last will and testament. So this is this is not jiving it's not jiving with what reality is so isabel rennie says i uh his head is so shiny i might be able to see the future in it <laughs> i think the future is jail yeah yeah um so yeah and then after you receive after you're pre-qualified you get a confirmation and it's like, congratulations, you can now be selected for contracts for the government of Canada. And we'll talk about it later, but I know for a fact he's lying with what he's saying right now. You couldn't just grant that contract directly from CBSA. There'd have to be a whole new process around it. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, I understand that there's Whenever contracts are, are issued, there are layers of approvals, I imagine. Um, can you speak to uh, a little bit in terms of what layers? It's not that President Osofsky just writes a check or Mr. Utano or Mr. McDonald writes a check to Butler AI. There are layers of approvals. Can you speak to some of those layers? Were they implemented in this case, knowing that it was a national emergency? Um, were those still applicable in this case? It's important to understand this. As the technical authority on the contracts, which is something that the articles and Butler got wrong, we are the technical authorities. We are not the contract authorities. So we are allowed to sign off that we have the funding and the scope. We are not allowed to sign off or push the button to execute any type of contract or negotiate contracts or do any type of invoicing. At the CBSA, Within us, there was a controllership, which is under the CFO area. They are responsible for expediting contracts. If it's above a certain threshold, it goes over to PSPC, and PSPC expedites it. But that's the genesis, I think, of some of the problems that were ex exposed here. They call kept calling us contract authorities, which we are not. We were never in a position to put these contracts in place and make contracting decisions. Uh... No, no, because it depends where the budget's coming from. PSPC just doesn't like sign, like they'll, they'll sign a contract after you've selected the vendor. And the, we, we talked about this before, the initial authorization to release funds, that has to be signed, it would have been signed um, by- The minister? John Oswowski. Oh. It would have been initially signed there. If it's over a million dollars, it goes up. Um, and CBSA submits all of their all of their asks that are over a million dollars up to guess what, everybody, the minister's office. And we've also obtained. A document that shows every single initiative that CBSA was requesting to have sign off during that time. One of those 
was the arrive can application. Shows the amounts and everything. And whose office signed off on that? That would be Minister Marco Mendicino. And there is a lady that was under him who was the parliamentary secretary to the Minister of Public Safety. And her name is Pam Damoff, who was just convicted on an ethics violation, by the way. So there's some interesting correlations that are going on here. Now, if what he is saying is correct, then none of that would have happened. Okay? So, uh, and, and all of these types of documents, we're, we're going to show them tomorrow. So don't worry. You're going to get them in a video and you're going to be able to see what we see. Um, so don't worry about that. Um, but there's a direct tie there. So when he's saying, well, we don't do the negotiating. Well, yeah, yeah, you are. The contract is with you. It's, it's by way of PSBC. They have the contract signed. Sure. But it belongs to you. Because what? You, you think PSPC is going to be sitting there saying, well, you know, we're the contract authority. That, that means they're accountable for everything else. No, that's not how it works. Again, convenience versus not. And thank you to Humble Tracker for a ten dollar super chat. I feel Cameron was bullied back in school, just like Justin Trudeau by Mr. Perry. Rest in peace. I saw that meme, and I I wasn't sure if it was actually true. I I really hope it was true <laughs> that uh, Matthew Perry was uh, ganging up on Trudeau. But uh, if you guys know if it's true or not, let me know in the chat. I'm curious. All right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. You basically. St whether the horses can finish the race. Is that correct? You sort of give an opinion on whether the horses if, in front of you can finish the race. If we picked wrong horses, yeah. we would be told we couldn't use them. Okay. Yes. No! What? If we picked wrong... Who were you going to be told? No, the, the only way that happens is if you pick horses that... If you picked a vendor that wasn't pre-qualified. That's where the problem happens. If you pick a vendor for a $6 million contract, as you stated, and then that goes to PSPC, and PSPC is going to be like, well, well, they're not a qualified vendor. You can't do business with them. That, that would be the only time that you can't do that. So, like, don't even. Okay, gotcha. Um, what is the relationship, what type of uh, relationship in, in this process did you have with PSPC? What role did PSPC play in your con in your day to day conversations on this particular contract? Perhaps I'll start off AI. and then sure. move it to Antonio. Sure. Uh, when the pandemic hit, um, we needed help r really badly. Uh, we started working with PSPC almost immediately. I wouldn't say that we cut the controllership uh, finance area out, but we just went direct because we knew that we needed their help. Um, within a few months, we had started to work with them on developing a memorandum of understanding where we could help pay them to get some access to their resources to help us do contracting. Maybe from there, I'll pass it over to Mr. Yutano to finish off because he would have worked with them for another two years uh, during the process. Thank you for the question. And if you could also answer whether ultimately PSPC approved those contracts. So all contracts for ArriveCan were ultimately reviewed and approved uh, by PSPC going through our CBSA contracting uh, team. Uh, when Mr. McDonald left, I continued those conversations on those weekly bilats. We were meeting with them weekly because the pandemic was continuously changing, the requirements were changing. We wanted to make sure they were always apprised of the situation and the operational demands. And so we always sought their advice and their guidance before, uh, ask, before moving on any sort of, uh, or advancing any sort of uh, procurement or uh, work. So as the, as the contracting authority, we engage them all the time. You, d you delivered a, an app uh, that basically was utilized 60 million times by Canadians, kept Canadians safe, kept things moving across oh my the God. border. Uh, and you delivered it on time, on budget. Is that correct, Mr. Rotano? That's correct. Okay, that is correct. On budget? On budget. Wow, the Liberals should be, I don't know, accosted <laughs> for that statement. Like... 
on budget. Why would you think an app would cost $54 million? What is wrong with you? Like you can go on the Google app store right now and you can see just like hundreds of thousands of apps. Do you think all of those cost $54 million? Like, do you think that's a reasonable price? There's a lot more complicated apps than a ride can out there and they don't cost $54 million. Just saying. And, um, for those that, uh, for those that are interested in the breakdown, um, on, on what this is, you can actually check it out on the CBSA website, or you can take a look on, uh, on our other arrive can videos. We actually break it down and, and we go through it. So, um, wow. Okay. The conservatives wanted to use, is, sorry, Mr. Kasper, <laughs> we'll have plenty of time afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Before we get to start with Mr. Genoas, Mr. McDonald, um, Mr. Barrett was asking you if you could detail some of these issues. I know you mentioned they were in your package, but because we will not have them translated in time, would you be able to pull those items out and list them separately in a smaller amount so we can get them translated faster? Uh, or Mr. Chair, the, the clerk has been fantastic. If, if somebody could just write down what it is they want from me, I will undertake to get back to the committee as soon as I possibly can. We will do so. Thanks very much. Mr. Genos. Thank you, Chair. GC Strategies clearly got a very good deal here, so it really matters in terms of getting to the bottom of this who made the decision to hire GC Strategies. Now, I understood in your opening t uh, statement, both of you said that Min Doan was responsible for that decision. Is that, was my understanding correct? Yes. You're both nodding? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Doan very clearly and very explicitly testified before this committee uh, when he appeared on October 24th uh, that they were investigating who, trying to find out who, and to his knowledge, they weren't aware who. Uh, so to be clear, in, based on your testimony, Mr. Doan was lying when he appeared before the committee. I don't understand, uh, Mr. Chair and honorable members, how they could be investigating for a year who made the decision on ArriveCan. It's, it's quite clear. And if they had asked anybody on our team, they would have said the same thing. Okay. Can you uh, uh, provide us with additional documentation to support your version of events? And are there documents that we should request from Mr. Doan that would verify your version of events? No, uh, the only thing that I haven't provided and I can provide the committee with is uh, some names. I won't say them here, but I can provide some names that can substantiate uh, what I've said here today. And in your packages, uh, I, I can pull them out if you would like. Okay. Mr. Utano can also okay. pull his out. We're at a bit of a disadvantage because they haven't been able to be distributed yet. And I, I understand the circumstances around okay. trans translation, but you, you, you would undertake to provide to the committee in, in writing, uh, but not in public, the names of individuals who can verify your version of events. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, How are they going to verify that, though? Yeah, that's so bizarre. And the fact that he won't list them out loud, but we'll provide a list. But like, why doesn't he just say, ask for the emails between myself and Mendon? That's easy. Because his version of events never occurred, so there are no emails. Right. Right. I want to say thank you to Glenn Stewart with a $5 super chat. No, it was a castle. So was it a chalet? Was it a castle? Was it a cabin? We'll never know. But, like, Cameron, Cam, Cammy boy, this should be easy. This should be easy. All he would have had to say is, I have emails to Mindone, and you can request the same emails from Mindone. Like, that's that's easy. That's all they should have to have to be saying. And I have a feeling these people that will request that, that basically that will corroborate his story um are, are are not gonna have documentation or if they do then sure let's look at it but the question is, is what documentation do we need to request oh well uh no uh, i have names of people so what they're just gonna say yes cameron's telling the truth that's sketchy as heck yeah You sort of implied that Mr. Doan uh, wanted to make you the fall guy for what happened here. Um, would that be a, a correct interpretation of your version of events, that, that, um, that he made a decision um, and that someone somewhere decided that you two were going to be the ones made 
made to wear this and, and therefore um, not supported by the department and, and made to appear responsible for the decision. Is that your version of events? Yes, Mr. Chair. I felt incredibly threatened on that phone call with Min Dong on October the 28th. Uh, I talked to my old supervisor and then my boss on Monday and Tuesday morning uh, following that. I think Mr. Utano can tell you that he had a very similar experience with Mr. Dong as well. So uh, you had also referred to a, a, a conversation that was relayed to you, and maybe it was the same one in which uh, it was reported that Minister Mendicino wanted someone's head on a plate. Can you just explain further why and for what? Yeah, uh, please explain that. Whose, whose head he wanted? That, that was my discussion, and that was the day that Mindon threatened me. Uh, the discussion started off with Mindon telling me that uh, within the CBSA, there was a lot of work going on to prepare for OGO. This is almost a year ago. Yeah. And uh, I believe Mr. Mendicino was not happy. Mr. Mendicino wasn't there when Arrive Can kicked off and when all of this was going on, but there was a lot of news about Arrive Can. Min was worried that either he or Jonathan Moore were going to get fired. So he was talking about somebody's head on a platter. And he said, because Jonathan Moore had made a whole bunch of mistakes from an accounting perspective, talking about how much Arrive Can cost, it could go his way or it could go Mr. Doan's way because Mr. Doan was the CIO at the time. And then he turned, it turned, we were on the phone, but he stopped the conversation and he just said, you know, Cam, if I have to, I'm going to tell the committee that it was you. Right. He offered me the opportunity to say that it was Mr. Utano or tell Mr. Right. Doan that it was Utano and myself, uh, to which I said, if you do that, I will have to respond. And we ended the conversation. That night is the night that I wrote him the notes. I stayed up until about three o'clock in the morning trying to figure out how I could find some way to meet in the middle. And that's why the notes were written exactly that way, so that Mr. Doan could come to this committee and present without having... So you're referring to the email you sent, and I was going to ask you about that. So, so essentially, you, you were trying to be honest. You, you were tr what you're telling us is you were trying to be honest, but also avoid giving the direct answer that you've given the I committee today. I was trying to give him something that he could work with. He told me he had never been to committee before. Right. I believe his first appearance was two weeks ago. Yeah. He was very nervous about it, and I tried to give well, no, him no, some No help. wonder. I mean, the, the, the implication of what you're saying is that he made the choice to hire GC Strategies uh, and had, had some reason for doing so, and also that he came and told the committee that he didn't make the decision, didn't know who made the decision, and essentially, you're telling us that someone's head was going to be on a plate because, because somebody got rich, somebody benefited from, from this. Someone's head was going to be on a plate, and he wanted it to be yours and not his. So. I don't believe for a second that he was bullied. No, I don't believe for a second no. either. Here's some interesting facts that everyone should consider. So he says on October 28th, last year, is when he was threatened by Mindong. Right? October 28th. He was very clear on that. He said that a couple times. Well, this email that he wrote to Mindon with this alleged compromise. Well, everybody, that was written on October 20th. So, how is it possible... How is it possible that that happened? Thank you to Humble Tracker with another 10 Northern Perspective memberships. If you're a lucky recipient, please make sure you thank Humble Tracker. And yes, I have seen a couple comments about the audio. Um, again, the audio coming from Parle View where we downloaded this video is abysmal. And uh, you, you probably heard it there while Genuus was talking that it kind of like finally stabilized itself. So unfortunately, we don't have any control over that audio um, that is coming from Parliament. Actually, I just made a mistake there, everybody. I want to correct it because we try to be as accurate as possible. Um, it was a bit blurry on the email. It, uh, it was the 29th, not the 20th. So that explains that. But... This, this still feels pretty sketchy. Still feels pretty sketchy. Because it is. So so he had the conversation with Mindon on the 28th, and then on the 29th, he, he wrote this long email. So amending my, my statement about the 20th. So uh, let's keep going. 
I believe Mindone made the decision to go with GC Strategies out of the fact that he had been told that he could not use Deloitte. Deloitte was in the timeout penalty box, so to speak. Who? And who, who told him that they sorry. were in the penalty box? Very, very briefly. My understanding is that that came from above. Okay. You, you know, can, you, can you sorry, clarify what you mean by above? So sorry, that is okay. our time. Mr. Uh, Palowski, please. That's a sketchy answer. It came from above. The only above, like, like who's who's going to tell? Who's, like, I mean, don't. Okay, so who's above him? John Oswowski. And who's above him? Well, to go above him, he's going to the minister. The minister, yeah. So the minister's not going to give a crap who, who that's coming from, unless he's trying to imply above is PSPC. Give me a break. Um, Mr. McDonald, you said you felt threatened by Mr. Doan. Um, what, what was the threat? Holy crap, I didn't know Albert Einstein well, was in here. First of all, threat of employment. Uh, I had moved on to Health Canada. I had already been gone off the project for a year and a half. In my opening statements, I think I told the committee that when I left, I delivered a costing and it was $6.3 million. And now all of a sudden in the news and everything else, they're talking about $55 million. Uh, they were talking, Mr. Doan was talking about people getting fired. I, I also didn't want my name to come out at this committee. I worked really, really hard during the pandemic. I'm sure you did. And just the thought of being blamed for something that people were ta painting as bad when I, we, we did everything that we could to respond during the pandemic, the whole thing was just a horrible interaction. Uh, it seems like the horrible interaction continues with this committee. Um, I, I'm not normally on this committee, and the committees I'm on aren't quite this kind of inquisitorial process. But one thing it seems to me, and kind of looking at the fairness of this, um, some people are, are given like five minutes to ask a question. You're given one minute to respond. It's your oh, reputation that's at stake here. So I'm giving you the time to respond time. to some of the questions that perhaps you didn't have time to respond to. And I think specifically you were referring to the Globe and Mail article about the RCM MP probe that you had your big sheet of paper about the timelines and what was wrong. Do you, do you want to just take a bit of time to explain really? some of those things that you think um, they got wrong? Really? Sure. I, I guess, Mr. Chair, the reason why I, I did a timeline that was linear was because when I read the article, uh, there were just so many dates that kept on popping up, and sometimes they had the year, and sometimes <sighs> they didn't have the year. Uh, I feel that I've been misrepresented by Botler as having them pressure to work with Christian Firth. They, I, they were introduced to me by Christian Firth. They went around town presenting together as partners. They presented to my VP without me being there as partners. My VP responded calling them the team. Uh, I, I guess I, I feel kind of attacked after the fact from a Botler perspective. Uh, even even with Mr. Utano, the, the email that they're saying that they made these allegations, you guys will get a copy of it. I don't understand why Butler didn't provide a copy to the committee when they started off, because any normal common sense person that reads this email will know there are no allegations in it. They certainly didn't mention me on September 27th. And then all of a sudden on Twitter, they're dropping all these audio clips that are clearly edited. They're clearly put together in a way that provides anybody that listens to them wow. with uh, a focus that just doesn't exist. And so I, I guess from my vantage point, uh, wow. Mr. Chair and, and members of this committee, I don't think Butler was, was treated unfairly. I'll make one final point because you gave me the time and I really appreciate it. I've been trying to make this a couple of times. When the Crown has a contract with anybody, there's a task authorization. I've provided it in my package and I think it's really important for members to understand this. What Butler did the contract was for a feasibility study in six parts. So in other words, we're paying for somebody to refurbish the kitchen. They went out back and built a swimming pool and a jungle gym and a garage and wanted to charge the federal government hundreds of thousands of dollars for doing it. The Crown wouldn't pay for that. The Crown pays for what's in the contract. And if people went through the ATIP and watched all and read all the documents, they would see it says a discovery plan, a feasibility study, a fit gap analysis report, a pilot plan and metrics. Boom, pilot. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm just sitting here in shock and also very angry because he's like, oh, Botler was not treated unjustly. You know what? Like I said, Botler did not get paid for the work they did. And when they requested payment, 
they were told you have to give us the documents uh for for your complaints as well so that we have your evidence and you don't have your evidence anymore you know what i find rich everybody this is what i find rich this guy has the gonads in the words of the illustrious daryl stinson to sit there and say and insinuate Botler was trying to scam the government out of hundreds of thousands of dollars to build the swimming pool and a garage and the kitchen sink. Yet this guy is proud of the fact that he charged Canadian taxpayers $54 million for a app that didn't work. This is the false equivalency that this guy is actually trying to, to put forward here. Again, it's everyone's fault but him. Oh, GC Strategies. Oh, they're crooked. Oh, Dalian, they're crooked. Mindone, he's crooked. John Oswowski, he's crooked. Botler's crooked. Everybody's crooked. I'm the innocent one. And I, I love that he's assuming that Butler didn't provide this email to the committee. Because he said, well, why wouldn't they provide that to, to the committee? But, but they, they, they probably did. Matthew Galligan with a $5 super chat. Oh, goodness. It's like Justin Simberlake saying, cry me a river. This is pathetic. These crooks are so whiny. Just take responsibility for your actions. That's my Justin Timberlake impression, everybody, on a Tuesday evening. Holy moly. And Butler gave all of those deliverables that McDonald is reading out right now. Well, right. But here's the thing. Butler didn't have a contract. The contract was with PSBC and Dalian. Butler didn't even really get to negotiate. They were speaking with Christian. Christian gave the, the stuff to, to, um, to Dalian. PSPC never talked to Butler to even negotiate it. And, you know, I said it on our previous streams, and I'm going to say it again. These guys at Butler gave up their paychecks so that they could expose this and blow this wide open. Ritika Dutt and Amir Morv are heroes, and this guy is trying to besmirch their names. Yeah. That's not right. Yeah. And an executive summary. Nowhere in there does it say a pilot. And it's a chatbot. Why would the federal government ever pay $26 million a year for a chatbot? I'll stop there, Mr. Chair. But I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I take my reputation seriously. I have worked awfully hard to earn one. And I feel it's been sullied by some of the things that have been said at this committee, in the news, and by Botler themselves. Oh, boo-hoo, cry me a river. Selves. Yeah, and I will do everything I can, including lie my my pale red ass off to protect it. What a sleaze ball. Like, I'm sorry, but... Oh, I feel like I need a shower just watching this. You deserve everything that's coming to you. If, if, if you are seriously lying about all of this stuff and you've committed fraud on this government... And actively worked with your buddy Christian to effectively steal money from the Canadian taxpayers. You deserve everything that's coming to you, sir. Thank you to Ryan Paplinski with a two seventy nine super chat. Firth is the pool and backyard garage contractor. <laughs> Pretty much. If I have any time remaining, Mr. Utano, I give you the same opportunity to respond to anything you haven't had a chance. Thank you. Wow. Real quick, so I take allegations very seriously, and if they are presented to me, I will I will action them. And that even September 27th, there was no allegations. And I just want to read the re reply from Ms. Dutt. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your prompt action and response. It is much appreciated. Please accept my sincerest apologies for all of this and convenience to yourself and the CBSA. You have all been nothing short of amazing to work with, and I'm so sorry you had to come to this. Uh-huh. Well, since you opened that door, Utano... Would you all like to read or hear the rest of that email? 
because that's incomplete. Here's what it says in the very next paragraph. If possible, we would prefer to proceed with a brand new contract for the remainder of the project. This will allow us to ensure that all the legal checkboxes are clearly covered and also give the respective CBSA teams on the project the chance to specify key milestones and reflect their actual requirements. As the CBSA has already released the first tranche of payments to Cordex and Dalian GCS, we can settle the outstanding invoices with them and close up that relationship. I'll keep you posted when we have an update on that front. That's the rest of the email, everybody. Okay. Email from Mr. Utano later. Thank you. Let's have a follow-up meeting first when you are in town next week. Understand the frustration and apologies for this. Looking forward to the long overdue meeting. Trust all is well with you and your team. Tony. That's what Tony said. He's apologizing to them. But we don't want to be laying all that out. And these guys are so stupid that they don't know the committee has these emails. Tony is Antonio. This guy, Antonio Utano. Like, this is... This is, this is disgusting. These half-truths and half-emails that they're reading. And these guys have the balls to say that, that Bottler is editing their stuff to make it look like these guys are the bad guys. Wow. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Ms. McNola for two and a half, please. Merci beaucoup. Monsieur Utano, euh, en quelques secondes, est-ce que le gouvernement du Canada a pris les mesures nécessaires pour avoir au sein de ses, de ses fonctionnaires des personnes capables de développer des applications? C'était très difficile à écouter la question. Um, my priority in, was always and now it continues to be to develop our resources and our employees. At the just before the beginning of the pandemic, that was what the intention was of, of starting small with a, okay. a team called a Mobile Center of Excellence and bringing in the resources not to do but to teach and learn. Okay. Est-ce que est-ce que on a les ressources maintenant pour développer? Mon avis, dans des années et des années, de okay. développer les compétences nécessaires oh, pour développer ces types de, de, de logiciels. The arrive can apps était quelque chose très compliqué. Merci beaucoup. Monsieur McDonald, Monsieur Utano, en vous, en, en vous écoutant parler, j'ai l'impression qu'il y a une certaine culture du silence, du harcèlement puis de l'intimidation au sein de la, F, la SFC, CBSA. Est-ce que je me trompe? Peut-être que je peux commencer et Monsieur... Utano peut suivre. Euh, D'un certain point, oui. Euh, je ne pense pas que c'est toujours très grave, mais quand ça arrive, euh, les gens n'ont pas nécessairement une porte pour frapper, pour parler à quelqu'un, pour recevoir de l'aide. Dans notre cas, euh, c'est clair qu'il euh, y a certaines informations qui ont été là, mais euh, les gens n'ont pas été là pour euh, nous deux. So everybody picking fréquent? up words here and there. But yeah, my French isn't good enough to translate uh, it. Si fréquent. It only happened once so in, in my career. This is the first type of uh, events that have damaged uh, my character, my integrity, and my trust in, in, some, in some leadership. Um, I don't know what the right response is, if it's frequent or not. I've never had this experience. Oui, je vous remercie euh, beaucoup. J'ai plein d'autres questions, mais six secondes. Merci. Thank you. 
Okay, so clearly there was something wrong with the translation there. Um, Coolman0893 says, did the translator take a nap? My guess is that while this was being recorded, they switched it to the, um, I think they call it the floor channel. So when you're in parliament and when you're in committee, there's a channel that everything's in English. So if the person is speaking in English, you just hear them. If the person is speaking in French, it's translated to English and that's what you hear. Um, and then there's a French channel that does the same thing, but in French, and then there's like the floor channel that for people who are bilingual, they don't need the translation. So they just hear whoever's speaking and, and hears them speak and that's it. Uh, and the question about, um, why is there a separatist party, uh, allowed in committee? Well, you know, the catch is, I believe the threshold is 25. You need to have 25 people. Um, and we want to say thank you to Trish Pru with a $5 super chat. Uh, it says, will any of these people actually be held accountable and punished appropriately? We certainly hope so. It seems like they're going at them pretty hard in committee. There is an RCMP investigation. Um, yeah, all we can hope is that justice prevails and, and that they do see some jail time, hopefully. Anyhow, as I was saying, um, you need to have, I believe it's 25 members of parliament to be classified as a party, considering the block has 32. They're technically classified a party, so they're allowed to be present at committee. Um, you notice the Green Party isn't, and the independents are not either, because they're not, they don't have party status within the, within the government. Thank you, uh, Ms. Spignola. Uh, Mr. Johns, please. Mr. McDonald, do you have any idea why Deloitte was in the penalty box? Uh, Mr. Chair, my understanding from the discussion uh, was there, there's a big project called the commercial, uh, I don't know, CARM, car, CARM uh, something about risk management, commercial uh, uh, assessment risk management project. Uh, I believe it's about three hundred and fifty million dollars or so three seventeen uh, and it wasn't going well at the time so why do i know um, that and you don't i i, I believe what does that mean uh, i believe it was uh not on time and not on budget in terms of where the project milestones were supposed to be and so uh the the company had been put on timeout uh no work was to be done even even though there was a global pandemic mr don threatened you Exactly, can you clarify why he would threaten you, what the threat was? So, uh, I got a phone call on, I think it was the 27th, of course it from was a, phone a call. member of his inner circle. I can provide her, her name and information to corroborate this. Um, she told me that uh, Kelly Belanger had told her not to call me and uh, that Min had been particularly directing his attention towards saying that I was the one that had made the decision that it would be GC Strategies, even though the entire team that was helping to brief Min Doan all the way had not said that. Um, so when I talked to Min Doan the next day, he had already asked me to help him with the committee. So this is why it was a bit jarring for me. Uh, he was pretty upset. At times he was almost crying. At times he was almost yelling. Uh, he basically said that somebody's head was going to be on a platter and he started between him and Jonathan and then he quickly switched it to say he was going to say that it was me that made the decision if, uh, if, if, the, if he was asked. But he made the decision, is that correct? He made the decision? Yes, he made the decision. I brought him two decisions. He took one away and told me to go and I went. But he, he knew came it was to our committee strategies. and said it wasn't him that made the decision. Uh, Mr. Mr. Johns and honorable members of this committee, I have members of my team that came here to support me. There's, if the CBSA had have even just asked my team, they would have known who made the decision. There was, it was clear. Everybody in government knows the DG wouldn't have made a decision like that. And and Mr. Doan, uh, I I don't know. He he was the one that got a non-advertised appointment. I I competed successfully in an open competition for my my EX4. Uh, Mr. Doan, when he was asked that question, he, he answered it a little bit differently, and you'll have to ask him how he was promoted. Thank you uh, both. Uh, Mr. Genwis, I understand you're starting off. You know, this kind of aligns with Christian's statement of everybody has dirt on everybody. Just saying. Anyway, Genuous, give us something. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I suspect 
there will be general agreement uh, of this committee in light of the testimony we've heard today to ask Mr. Doan to come back as soon as possible for a full two hours yeah, by please himself. Do. Please Is there do. agreement on that point? That's perfect. Thank you very much. Thank please you. Please do. Um, and I think probably as soon as possible, Chair, but we, we give you that discretion as always. Um, Mr. McDonald, uh, I think it's very important that you said that Mr. Doan heard from above that Deloitte was in the penalty box um, and that that is why GC Strategies was, was selected. Uh, that phrase does, does um, include some euphemisms that I, that I do want clarity on, though. What precisely do you mean by from above? Doan was the vice president and CIO of the CBSA. There was only one person who was above him. My understanding is that all the VPs had been told that they could not work with Deloitte until the CARM project was back on track. So above him within the public service would have been, would have been the president, um, but above that is the political level. So I did not understand it to be a political decision, but if you're going to be calling Mindon, I'm sure you can ask him what he meant. Okay. Um, would, would anyone at the political level have been involved in these discussions as far as you know? Uh, not as far as I know. You, I you, you weren't the, in rooms with, where they were. Uh, I was okay. in, for a RiveCan, I was in one meeting with the minister's office. They asked me if it was secure, uh, and they asked me if it was scalable, to which I answered in the affirmative, and that was only one meeting. At, at what stage in the process was that meeting with the very minister? Very early, like very beginning. Was that before or after the GC Strategies was selected? I don't know that GC Strategies was selected at the time. It would have probably been concurrently okay. when we were kind of going. GC Strategies was not brought up. Okay. No contracting was brought up. They, they just wanted to make sure that it was secure because we were going to be collecting. But, but if they were asking, is it secure, presumably they were asking that in the context of a particular application or company. No, it was because we were taking away paper and okay. we were going to be using digital means. Okay. It, it, it was sort of... I wonder if you could follow up on, on that point regarding the timeline. So uh, what, what do you um, mean by, by penalty box? You mean they, they weren't to receive any contracts? That's yes, what penalty that's, box is. Th that was my understanding. Again, Mr. Okay. Dunn can explain. Yeah, yeah. It is um, sort of surprising to me that you would have this kind of informal process of companies being in the penalty box uh, and therefore not getting any contracts, which means other companies get them automatically like is is this normal where where sort of at a someone just decides this this company or that company is not going to receive any contracts for a while and we're gonna we're gonna give them to whoever else bids I, w I would say no mr. chair I wouldn't think it was normal at all but I will uh, I will preface that by saying this was like the second week of the pandemic and right. there was craziness everywhere uh, the the reason that the sole source and the national security exemptions exist is for emergencies, and this was declared a national emergency. In terms of the decisions around why we could or could not use a particular company, such as Deloitte, uh, that was not uh, my decision to make. Okay, in terms of the time I had left. It may have not been your decision, but you would have known. Are you really going to tell me that a director general at a government agency where this, like, remember, he's director general at the time at CBSA. Deloitte was working for a project on CBSA. This guy is trying to pass this off as he didn't even know about the project. A $350 million project, according to him. Yeah, 317. No. no, that's not true. He doesn't know that that's going on, and then he didn't know that shit hit the fan that basically terminated or paused Deloitte from doing any work. You're telling me you don't know that? Here's the other thing. Remember, this guy is the guy that's saying that all of this stuff happens through PSPC, right? Why would PC PSPC not know that? You're saying that any contract, any negotiation, any of that goes through PSPC. Why would they not know that? You knew damn well what was going on. So, like, this is stacking lies on lies on lies on lies, and this is this is what Genuous is, you know, he's 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 playing playing nice with him, I think, to bring some of this stuff out. 
Um, I do want to probe the point you referred to just at the end about, you said Mr. Doan got a non-advertised appointment. Um, there was sort of an implication in what you said, um, and I, I would like you to provide a little bit more on, on that. Um, are there are there certain relationships he has, uh, uh, access points? Uh, what's uh, I, do you think do you think his appointment uh, broke p protocol in some way? Um, what 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 were you sort of getting at with with that comment? Well, Mr. Chair, the only thing I can say is that uh, it was uh, alluded to or inferred that I had benefited because of arrive can at this committee and that I had gotten a promotion because of my work. And I wanted to make sure this committee was aware that I fully competed in a competitive process that was open and fair, and that I had resulted as being um, in a pool, and I was selected afterwards. Mr. Utano, as well, fully competed in a process. The others can speak for themselves as to how they are selected, but my, my, my base assumption is that uh, when I left, uh, the CBSA, um, Mr. Doan was in EX4, right. and he was promoted uh, to an EX5, uh, as well as others were okay. promoted in the agency. This is plain and simple distraction. This is all this is. This is, don't look at me, look at these other people. He has, he has been, that, that's been his strategy, his game plan, this whole hearing is to try to take the spotlight off of him, play the victim and say, oh, you know, these people were mean to me and, you know, this guy got a, an appointment without, you know, with no competition. And then when he's called on it, well, what do you mean by that? Well, you have to ask them. No. <laughs> yeah, you're the one making the claim. Clearly, you have some sort of knowledge on the subject. Alleged knowledge. Right? And then he's saying, well, ask them. Well... Dude, what are you what are you talking about here? Like this guy is so so sketchy. And just finally to put put a, a a sharp point on the process of selecting GC strategies. So Mindone chose, and part of why he made that choice is because Mr. Asoski, who was the president at the time, uh, had told him. Deloitte's a no. Is that is I, that? I will let Mendon answer for why he discounted Deloitte. I told you already what I heard from Mr. Doan. I brought my boss two options. I came out with one and the uh, decision to go. I went. He was aware that I went forward with it, obviously, because we built a Rive Can and we delivered it. I left about 13 months after a Rive Can was kicked off. Mr. Utano continued it. Mr. Doan was the CIO for the entire time. When this committee started asking questions, Mr. Doan was still the CIO. Thank you very thank much. You. Uh, Mr. Sousa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So there's a couple of things happening here today. One, there's Butler, oh, I'm gonna throw and then there's Arrive Can. <laughs> was Mr. Doan involved with the, uh, with the decision to have uh, GC strategy subcon... Did, was, was Mr. Doan involved with the Butler deal at all? Mr. Doan directed me to work with GC Strategies and Bottler who were working in partnership right. and get them ready for an executive presentation. Mr. Doan did not get involved in any of the contracting or subcontracting or any of that. He was aware and he had a meeting with Christian Firth and Bottler when I was not present on December the 6th. It's part of your package. He also followed up with them by email himself when I wasn't on the email, and I have that email that I can share with this committee. We appreciate it. <clears throat> GC Strategies and Baller had no contract with with CBSA, or, or, or the, it was all done through Cortex and uh, Dalian, right? Yes, sir. Um, is the RCN, now, the RCMP is not reviewing the Arrive Can application. Or process, they are reviewing the Butler allegations it's, being made. Gosh, these liberals, correct? To, to, to my knowledge, I believe to Mr. Had, and have you been approached by the RCMP? I, I know, Mr. Tano, you worked with the RCMP for some time. Have either of you been approached by the RCMP in this review? No. So no one's approached you or asked you any questions relative to, to the appointment of Butler and Butler's allegations. Okay. But you mentioned that the 
CTO does not approve the contract, the CFO is actually the one that cuts the check or approves it. But would they approve it without your input by way of the contract meets these requirements? They would have to rely on you to provide that information as well? Yeah, uh, maybe. Oh, my God, he actually asked a useful question. Yeah, I was going to say, that, uh, that sounded legit. He actually asked a useful question. The answer is yes. CFO is not going to just sign a contract unless the people that are closest to it are saying, yeah, this is, these are the guys that we need to select. Actually asked a useful question. Yeah, Isabel Rini, maybe he asked it by accident. Yeah, <laughs> Nobody's perfect, right? Maybe <laughs> Mr. Utano's best place to answer it, but I'll just start off by saying uh, we would fill in the paperwork for the justification that talks about the technical requirements, why a sole source justification is required, urgency in terms of time uh, and whatnot. Um, and, and there's usually a back and forth with that because they vet this stuff really thoroughly. They make sure that everything is done like... To, there's, a, to, there's a threshold as well, right, by which it needs approvals? Is that correct? So, so the CFO organization at CBSA is called Controllership. They have their own governance for all of contracting that's separate from the IT branch. And how did that affect the decision with regards to this, the Bottler uh, uh, proposal? Bottler would have been a task authorization on an existing contract. Uh, I've provided it yeah. for your thing. It would have come through as Dalian Karatex. They would have looked at it for form and fitness. They would have looked at it for compliance within the contract because the contract itself had a scope and it had categories and PSPC would have done the same thing. So when the contractor then, the prime contractor who is Dalian, responds to the request, they respond to it with an estimate of the cost, the resources, the security certificates, and everything. And that goes through the, the contracting people. Fair. We, we do the vetting in terms of the contracting team outside of PSBC that they meet the grids, that, that there's, it's fit and it's right. compliant, and then uh, I would sign the task authorization. A couple things that are, are puzzling about this. So remember before he stated that the reason that the contract was terminated is because the HR department said that there is no capacity and no staffing to do it, right? That's, that's what he said. Later, he says that Butler was trying to essentially scam the government out of $350,000 by building everything but the kitchen sink against these supposed deliverables. So if Butler was building an app and they submitted two of these deliverables and it was everything but the kitchen sink and nothing to do with a feasibility study, and we are also told that the only way that they get paid is when the agency signs off on those deliverables, why would Butler have gotten paid anything then? Because he's totally lying. Well, I know, but that's that's the that's the point. They wouldn't have gotten paid anything. So there's this one's a this one's a tough one, everybody, because there's unlike Christian Firth, McDonald has a brain. He's not a dumb guy. He's very intelligent doesn't change the fact that he's lying and he's still slipping up. But he has clearly tried to think all of this through, worked with Utano on their story, and piece it together as much as possible and omitting very key aspects, some of which we've shared with you. Right? So, yeah. Um... Let's continue. So GC strategies, and there's been references in regards to their mode of operandi and how they uh, act, and they're sort of a two-man show, and, but they assemble all of the experts to provide for a contract as they do for a RiveCan. That's not what they did with Butler. 
they actually partnered with Butler to try to come forward with an opportunity to do a big deal thereafter. Um, and I think that's part of the reason that they're upset, because that didn't come to fruition. Um, they also made reference to a cabin or a cottage or a chalet. Is that you? I mean, a lot of allegations are made about your relationship with Firth. Can you explain? So, so uh, I just want to be unequivocal about this. Uh, I've never had a contractor or a vendor or anybody at my house or at my cottage. Uh, I have a little cabin in the woods. I go there sometimes, and I, especially during the pandemic, to just get away from things as I was working extremely hard. Um, I've met Christian Firth three times out of a workplace in my entire life. Two of those times were after the pandemic and after Arrive Can started. Two of the three times was with Mr. Utano and my mobile development team, and I was there for about 15 or 20 minutes. I have had lunch with Christian Firth one time. I paid my own bill after the pandemic before I left the CBSA. That is all the interactions I've had with Mr. Firth. I've only had a professional relationship with Mr. Firth. I do have fairly informal relationships with people. As I've told this committee, people call me Cam all the Cam. time. They know that they can reach me. I leave my calendar open, I answer my phone, and I try and be as open and available as I can to employees. Oh my God, what a saint. Yeah, the, like this entire committee, he's been trying to paint himself as the victim and also like this great, amazing person. Um, like you're there to answer questions. You're not there to, you know, give a character statement about yourself. So this is very suspicious that he's kind of like making this a priority in the committee. It's like an, it's like a victim impact statement. Yeah. No, it, not even that. It's just, uh, yeah, maybe that is what you'd call it. I'm not sure. He's just going on about what a great guy he is. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite revolting actually. Yeah. Um, so, but here's the other problem. Like, the only interactions he's had with Christian Firth is two before Arrive Cam in 2018 and one after. Well, what happened to 2009? You said you knew him since 2009. You would have had to interact with him in 2009 if you'd known him since 2009. So... Okay. Staff, peers, and I was asked to work with private sector. So anything new, innovative, anything that sounded interesting, I would obviously be interested in. Mr. Firth had partnered with several different companies in the private sector. He told this committee that he worked with 22 other government departments. He had 40 some million dollars in sales, and he had been fairly successful at doing it. People talk in town. Mr. Utano can testify to the fact that we called a couple of different departments and kind of did a reference check to see Excuse if the work sorry, was good. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Was, thank you. I'll give you more time um, later. No worries. <laughs> Mr. Brock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. McDonald, for clarifying your secondary residence. There was uh, a quite, uh, quite an issue last Thursday as to whether or not cabin, camp, tent, chalet. So <laughs> thank you for clarifying that. Another area I want clarified, sir, and I've listened very carefully, and, and if, you, if you said it once, you, you may have said it half a dozen times, as, as well as you, Mr. Utano, in terms of being very unequivocal in your uh, responses that it was uh, Mr. Doan who was responsible for retaining GC strategies with respect to this Botler contract. And I just want to confirm that again. That it, that is correct. That is your evidence, correct? I will try and say it to you as clearly as I can, but I need a minute, and I will give you as much time as you want. I, I don't have a hard you, time Can you to reduce leave. it to 30 seconds? Mr. Doan saw the proposal that I sent him after I received it and okay. asked for a meeting. Mr. Doan had a meeting with Butler and saw a demo. Mr. Doan told me to get them ready for an executive presentation. Okay. I have my notes there in there. The president, the VP of HR, the CFO, and others saw the Butler presentation. They were interested in it, and there was general consensus that we should go ahead with some work. 
I worked with my peers at the DG level to develop a statement of work, which was for a feasibility study, not a pilot. Okay. I emailed my boss and told him I was using an existing contract, and I sought permission to go ahead, and I received endorsement to go ahead. Okay. Again, you and Mr. Utano did not specifically seek out GC strategies to be the ghost contractor, correct? No, we received a proposal from Butler and GC Strategies. So the answer is correct. Correct. How do you then reconcile, sir? There we go. And I'm, this is a question to you, Mr. McDonald. A year and a half after you leave the CBSA, you write uh, an email to Mr. Doan as well as other members of CBSA, uh, Ms. Sabarin, Mr. Utano, and Mr. Bird, October 29th, 2022, and uh, I'm quoting various passages in, in, in this particular email uh, attributable to you. You asked me for advice on the key question of why GC strategies, but I also think we are all grappling with who selected GC strategies. If you're so unequivocal today, November the 7th, 2023, why were you equivocal on the 29th of October, 2022? As I explained, Mr. Chair, I wrote that email to Mindone after I had been threatened. I wrote that email trying to give Mindone words okay, thank that you. he could use at this committee. Thank wow. Wow. Really? Did I just understand that correctly? He said he was trying to coach Mindone at the committee? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what he said he was trying to do. Is, is that legal? <laughs> I mean, like with parliamentary privilege and everything? Um, yeah. So. Yeah, this is the. This is the coaching on what to say. Why GC strategies? In addition to what is attached, if you do not like my draft response, uh, known to be working with other organizations and having delivered, limited time to make a decision, was an initial proof of concept. Oh, the scope. Was an initial proof of concept to see if something could be done to respond. That sounds like a pilot, everybody. POC, proof of concept, is another word for a pilot. I'm reading this email that was uh, sent on the 29th that Brock is referring to. Somebody says, I hear doggies. Yes, you do. <laughs> Perhaps previous experience with the agency has to enable this type of decision. The IT team brought the opportunity to procurement who were involved throughout and helped make it happen. Helping by guiding this. Like, this is, there's like three pages more of Cam giving to Mindone what to say as in committee if they asked him why GC strategies. Let's see where Brock goes with this. Thank you. Um... I'm going to caution you as well, sir. If you don't want to answer this, I can understand your lawyers are present, but there is some really damning information in this email, which in my view, as a former prosecutor, encroaches upon criminal law in terms of interfering with witness testimonies. There you go. You're, ask, you're, you're actually specifically coaching them on what to say uh, with anticipated questions put to them. I'll give you some examples. Uh, Suggest I will start by saying that I'm not per personally familiar with GC strategies during the time in question. If pressed, come on, we want some accountability here. Who decided? How did this company get a contract for almost $9 million? Who made money off of this? Who was getting rich off of taxpayer dollars? Mr. Chair, I stand by my statement and I don't believe there was a single person and I'm not actually aware of any rules being broken or wrongdoing. This is not how we operate at CBSA. Why are you coaching witnesses who've been compelled to attend at a committee to tell the truth? What, 
What on earth compelled you to give these suggested answers to them, sir? I'm going to start crying now. Uh, I was threatened, and I was threatened, and it's not my fault, and I'm great to my employees, I'm great to my children, and I'm great to the, the guy who mows my lawn, and I'm such a wonderful person with my chalet. Like, you know, it's a cabin in the woods. Or a tent. I don't know. That's what this guy is going to say. That's what this guy's going to say. Mr. Chair, I was emailed by Mindone a briefing package. I believe it was Wednesday of that week. Did he ask for your advice on yes. what to say? He asked me for my help. He wouldn't Did he even ask call. your advice on what to say at committee? He asked me for feedback on his briefing. I'll ask he again. Told... Did he ask your advice uh -oh. on what to say at committee, sir? Yes or no? Generally, yes. Generally. And the reason why I can say that is because his briefing package was just full of facts and data, and it had no verbiage. And he commented to me that he did not have the words to use, which is why I wrote what I wrote. Did someone coach you on what to say today? I practiced. Yeah, I did. No, did I, someone other than you coach you on what to say? No. How about you, Mr. No, Utano? No. no. No? Thank you, Chair. Oh, that rattled them. <laughs> that rattled the hell out of them. I, th I think I think Cameron's expression says all you need to. Because Brock has spoken to hundreds of Cameron McDonald's before. Hundreds. He has seen this guy, and and. and I love Brock's me methodology because he's so polished at this, right? He used to do this for a living. <laughs> Still does it for a living. <laughs> um, when Brock's like, okay, so this is your statement. I just want to clarify that, right? Well, uh, uh, you'll need a minute. Uh, clarify that. Yes. Okay. You're sure. Yes. Okay. How do you reconcile that with this? Oh, well, I was threatened. Yeah, but you're coaching him. This is, this is interfering in witness testimony. That's a criminal offense. Uh, uh, uh. Mr. Shawari, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be sharing my time with my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Kuzmerchik. Um, two and a half minutes. Okay. Um, Mr. McDonald, can you explain the difference between a pilot and a um, assessment, as you call it, or a... Yeah. I, I, I appreciate it. I'll try and go quickly. So, so the whole thing is a lot of times people call things pilots, but they just jump right in and they don't have any ability to measure its success or failure or its cost or its benefit. And so you, you kind of just like you, you try something like let's try this app. And, and then afterwards, like you're stuck with it because everybody likes okay. it, but you don't so, know. So there's a pilot and there's a feasibility. Yeah, so From an out point, out po output point of view, is the feasibility output feasibility study output the same as a pilot output? Not, not at all. Can you tell me what's a pilot output in your opinion? Yeah, so, so the reason why we would do a feasibility study is so that when you actually run the pilot, you can measure whether it was successful or not. So is it fair not? to say if we're going to do a pilot, they would be configuring their system based on all the data to be able to prove that it works? 100%. Whereas a feasibility study is whether there are going to be proper milestones, and that milestone, those seven milestones, uh, happens to be, or six milestone happens to be what? A hundred percent. Okay. You, you would look at whether or not it would even work in the first place before you would go out and buy something. Okay. So after two of those six milestone, I believe, were completed, there was a decision made to stop. And there is a con there is a there is a contradiction between why it stopped, um, whereas we are hearing from Butler that fully configured, ready to go. Uh, on a pilot, and then we hear from... Okay. Um, Butler was not saying fully configured, ready to go. They were saying this was a pilot. And the pilot would be trialed at CBSA. Well, and if I'm not mistaken, they said that they had completed their objectives. The, they completed the yeah. deliverables. Yeah. And the all the deliverables would have culminated in a proof of concept. A proof of concept is a prototype. And that's, that's, it's basically saying a cabin is a chalet, everybody. A proof of concept is a pilot. Okay. So 
it's the same thing. Often companies will have vendors come in and do a proof of concept and it's base configuration. It's to get it working. Is it functional? Is it going to do what we want? Yes. Okay. Then you move to the next stage. Okay. That's, that's what happens. And they've said proof of concept in here. They have said that. CBSA saying no. Feasibility study, two of the milestone was done. The rest of them stopped because they, did, they were not compliance or there was shortage of staff and funding for that. Which one is true? I can answer that, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I can answer that real quick. So two, two of the milestones were completed and paid for. The client was CBSA's human resources branch. They issued an, a note to us, and it's in the package, requesting that we cancel the TA, citing reasons for capacity and lack of uh, employees' resources that could, they can commit to the project, to which we, we, we executed on their request and canceled the TA. Yeah, so there's, there's no talk about, like, you're caught in your own lie. Cameron's sitting there saying, you know, that Butler was full of it because they were, they were building a proof of concept rather than doing a fe feasibility study. That's what Cameron's trying to say. But both Cameron and this guy have said, oh, well, you know, the reason that the project was canceled is because HR didn't have enough resources. Right? Like, you can't have it both ways, guys. That's the problem with lying. So, sounds like HR was just fine. Tickety-boo, based on your version of events. And they just didn't have the time. Butler's version is that it seems like, based on our understanding, it seems like when they wouldn't hand over all of the evidence for the misconduct, that's when the contract was terminated. So... And since they've been recording evidence for a while, who knows? But that's that's kind of what we understood. The other file four milestones of a feasibility study were never done. Thank you. I'll leave the rest of my time to Mr. Ayer. Uh, Mr. Cameron, the um, this the Arrive Can project, because this is the Arrive Can study, uh, came together in five days, I think. Uh, as was mentioned, sort of, you know, the the uh, the players. In a normal situation, in a non-national emergency situation like COVID represented, how long would a process like this take on months. average? M months, several months. Several months, two months, uh, eight months, 12 months? At the CBSA, even longer. I mean, it, it, Mindon did say he had 1,400 people. There were so many distributed teams, different technology stacks and everything else. Easily four to six months. Easy. Uh, easily. You were asked to do a six-month project in five days, pull it together. Can you put that into context for us? It was very fast pace. It was very intense. Our teams worked incredibly hard. I had really incredibly people, incredible people that I worked with. They were professionals. They knew very, very quickly what there was but you guys and didn't what do there any wasn't work. on the table with which to work with. Maybe That's why you outsourced it. I'll just, add, I'll just add real quick. The business requirements were never defined when the pandemic hit. We never had the whole picture, and that was the challenge. We started with a basic digital form, fairly, fairly simple, fairly straightforward, but then the complexity came with a pre-border, at-border, post-border, notifications, accounts, et cetera, et cetera. The notifications? Oh, no. The technology and the infrastructure, it never existed when the pandemic in, started. In your 20-plus years, have you seen a project this complicated come together this fast? I, I've, I've, I've heard quoted that that was one of the most complicated integrated projects in, in, our, in our time. I appreciate the context. My conservative Are you colleagues me? Would, have, would have provided you $200,000 to complete this ArriveCan project. Yes. What would have happened? to travel along the Ambassador Bridge in Windsor if you had a $200,000 Rive Can app. What would happen to Canadian... Okay, be quiet. Yeah, oh, it's so complicated. It's so expensive, except those two guys built it in a weekend. Actually, they each built their own version in a weekend. Well, and this is what this guy's trying to say. What would have happened if you only spent $200,000? Well, of course, because he's a liberal. He has to justify this gigantic inflated price tag. Yeah, it's ridiculous. 
uh, their, uh, their information, their private information, had you been only given $200,000 to create the ArriveCan app, as my colleagues across the table would have, would have right done. Right there. What would have happened? Right there. The privacy, to trade, medicines coming through the border. Yeah. Could it be done? Not, not two, what we built over those months and years? No, not for 200000 impossible. So what the Conservatives would have it. had built for Canadians to use in their time of crisis would have been junk? It wouldn't have worked. It wouldn't have worked. It would not have worked. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, of course, because what are they going to say? Right? They're going to say, well, actually, yeah, we're, we're, we, we will admit that we're incompetent idiots. Well, and the liberals are getting chewed up in the media about this, right? Why did you waste $54 million on an app that somebody built in the weekend for a fraction of the price? Yeah, it's BS. It's BS. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kuzmerchuk. Ms. Vignola, for your final th round, please. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Uh, Monsieur McDonald. Dans votre allocution, vous disiez que l'étude de faisabilité comportait six parties, chacune d'une valeur de Fire 70 000 guy, right, uh, Et yeah, que le projet pilote n'était pas là, dans le cadre des travaux. Hey, de ce 70 000 <laughs> qu'est-ce qui allait à... Est-ce que vous êtes au courant de qu'est-ce qui allait à Butler, qu'est-ce qui allait à uh, GC Strategies, puis à Dalian Credits? Oui, non. Euh, comme fonctionnaire, nous n'avons pas cette information-là. Nous ne rentrons jamais dans les discussions par rapport le partenaire okay. et les finances Things avec les autres. Est-ce que ce serait une amélioration importante et facilitante du... du dirons-nous, dans l'évaluation d'un contrat, puis d'où l'argent, où l'argent va, si on disait, écoutez, là, ça, des sous, 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 sous contractants, j'exagère, mais des fois, on n'a pas l'impression de tant que ça, là, ça, ça c'est pas rentable, là. On peut pas, si on donne un contrat à quelqu'un, il faut pas avoir deux, puis trois, puis quatre sous-contractants, là. Est-ce que ce serait une solution de dire, on arrête ces, ces folies-là? Moi, je suis spécialiste euh, en information et de technologie, pas en contrat. Mm -hmm. euh, je, ne, je ne pense pas que ça fonctionnerait très bien euh, si on cède le tout. Mm -hmm. euh, on veut laisser de l'espace pour le secteur privé, pour engager ensemble, pour résoudre les problèmes euh, sans la politique. Okay. Euh, C'est seulement pour le secteur privé. Uh, mais, mais pour moi, je ne suis pas une, uh, je n'ai pas d'expertise uh, dans les contrats. Ok. Au niveau d'Arrive Can, oui. JC Strategies a eu pour 9 millions pour avoir été chercher des spécialistes. Euh, D'autres compagnies ont été approchées aussi. Est-ce que vous, est-ce que vous vous souvenez lesquelles? Puis quelle partie du travail elles ont apporté? Oui, uh, peut-être si c'est d'accord, M. Lutano peut mm -hmm. répondre. Il y avait plus que 20 compagnies en total. The, all the companies were right. Yeah, so there was, there was 19, over 19 technology vendors we partnered with, uh, with, our, with our CBSA internal employees and 19 other okay. vendors. Other examples were Amazon, uh, Blue Ink, um, Tech Systems, uh, BDO, And I'm just going okay. off and Puis dans ces, dans ces compagnies-là qui ont été approchées, est-ce qu'il y en a plusieurs qui ont utilisé une stratégie de sous-contractants ou de sous-sous-contractants? C'est usuel comme méthode? Oui, oui, oui. C'est ce que je... je de, de ce que je comprends, toutes les compagnies qu'on travaille avec dans le gouvernement, dans l'espace le, de GITI ou l'informatique, mm -hmm. uh, spécialement <laughs> quand on a besoin de quelque chose unique <laughs> ou um, com complexe. Merci. Est-ce qu'on continue à mettre l'argent dans Arrive Can jusqu'à maintenant, étant donné que c'est vraiment optionnel? Uh, nous ne sommes mm -hmm. pas uh, mm -hmm. l'agence frontalière maintenant, je ne sais okay. pas. Je vous remercie beaucoup. Thank you, uh, Mrs. McNola. Mr. Uh, Johns, please go ahead. Gee, Johns has talked like yeah, four so five times. Mr. McDonald, in the brief you provided to the committee this morning, you described Ms. Dutt trying to circumvent the procurement and contracting process and, and contract directly with CBSA, despite not being an approved vendor. Are you aware that Bother AI is an approved vendor? For the question, Mr. Chair, I, I have been made aware uh, that Butler is an approved vendor. They became, as far as I understand, an approved vendor, but uh, on a pre-qualified list, which is not a standing offer 
with the Government of Canada, and they only did so, to my understanding, in Q3 of 2021, well after I signed the TA. Okay. Uh, I also, I think in Mr. First's testimony, he said that he helped them to qualify on this invitation to qualify list. So I, I, I'm not aware it's, of Bottler's uh, It's business. my understanding Bot Bottler has been a qualified vendor under Band 2 of the AI source list since 2020. November 2020, which right. allows them to provide work for up to $4 million before taxes. The Treasury Board makes this information publicly available. Now, Bottler is able to contract directly with the federal government. So it's really concerning to me that you describe these many contracting layers with every pass-through uh, is, is what I'll call, uh, what you've cited, taking a cut, that you describe that as a regular contracting process. And you describe Ms. Dutt's efforts to get accountability from your contractors as, quote, circumventing normal processes. So do you really consider this case to be a standard example of procurement procedures being properly followed? And I'm asking specifically about the layers of um, subcontracting and the, and the lack um, of any consent or discussion regarding timelines, deliverables, payment amounts. Good question, Mr. Johns. NDP. Yeah, yeah I don't, you, you guys know how I feel about the NDP. So um, I'm actually really impressed with, with that question. He seems uh, to be going at these guys pretty hard. Yeah, um, so we're going to be talking about this tomorrow as well. So on Monday, November 16th, 2020, Bottler was sent an email by Public Works, okay? And it was basically saying, congratulations, you are now a pre-qualified vendor. And Cam, our boy, was hoping to, 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 to skirt around this and say, oh, oh no, they, 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 weren't in a, they weren't a pre-qualified vendor until right before they complained. Actually, that would have been during the same quarter. Like, come on, guy. What do you think is going to happen? Like, with all this stuff in, in, in public domain, do you really think that Bottler was just a pissed off vendor that they didn't get paid, that they were trying to scam the government, they didn't get paid, and they were going to come to committee bring a bunch of emails and then get screwed and because they were lying, do you really think that that's what was going to happen? They think that they're so clever. These guys think that they can just lie and say whatever they want and, and people will believe them. Like they believe their own BS. Why, don't, why wouldn't anybody else believe it? You yeah. know, that's what these yeah. guys think. Just wait till you see our episode tomorrow evening, everybody. Just Wait. Mr. Chair, I think what's important to understand is that I am not the contract authority. This task authorization with Dalian and Craddix went through CBSA's contract authority. Oh, now, now he's authority distancing himself. Now PSPC. he doesn't know anything. PSPC validated it. it. I was actually reported that they validated it, and they found that it was proper and within the contract. So that's important to know. The other thing that's important to know that the band two that you're talking about is a pre-qualified invitation. It is not a standing offer. So anything that the government wants to do would have to go out as an RFP and Butler would have to compete for it. It's not a standing offer for the government to just go give a contract to somebody. And uh, the rest of you'd have to talk to PSBC. I'm, I'm not a contracting expert. Uh, <laughs> I, I... Like this guy's a contracting expert when he wants to be and he's not a contracting expert when he yeah. doesn't want to yeah. be. Yeah, what you have to understand is uh, only only pay attention to what I'm telling you. Only pay attention to what I'm telling you because I'm right. Stop. Stop. Just kind of follow the paperwork that people tell me to do. I did it, and uh, I think okay, it's been okay, validated. But, but you're, you're responsible to understand and follow procurement procedures. PSPC yes. is, uh, they're not a babysitter. Mr. Utano, uh, you have a subcontractor who no longer feels comfortable associating with your contractors, who's writing to you about a non-payment issue, contract-related issues, and asking you for a clean agreement. They're telling you they have no legal or signed agreements with any of the parties and that they gave no consent for any of the terms. Are you saying that this does not count as a report Good. of misconduct? None of, none of what it contains could be misconduct? Good boy. Awesome. Mr. Johns is really, like, tightening those screws. Yeah. Like, again, another good question. 
He's referring to the second part of the email. Remember when Cameron was saying, oh, well, you know, why didn't Butler provide that email? Well, they did. And you know how we know? Because Mr. Johns is looking at it right now. That's where this question came from. And, and this is what we said before. How are you saying that none of this in here are allegations of something that happened? And Mr. Johns is saying, yeah, Mr. Uteno, how are you saying that none of these are allegations? Thank you for the question. So with respect to the private relationships and partnerships companies enter into amongst themselves, that is outside of our purview and our scope. In fact, if I look back at the article of October 6th, someone named Anita Chan from PSPC had the exact same response to Ms. Dutt. We just simply can't do things as we, from, as we think or feel. We have to follow policies and procedures. Moreover, we've got privacy clauses that we sign with the primary contractor that we are not allowed to discuss uh, proprietary information between CBSA and the primary uh, contractor, Dalian Karatex. Thank you, Mr. Utano. Um, Ms. Kusu, please, for five. Thank you, Chair. Uh -oh. Uh, why do you believe that Bottler was known as the President's Project? Are you asking me? Either, either of you. Um, I, I really, so at the very beginnings of it, I had limited to no real um, exposure to uh, the President on and on this project, to be honest, quite honest with you. So I don't, I don't have an answer yeah. for you. Mr. McDonald? This was, the President was seized at the time with the cases of sexual harassment at the CBSA and was trying to do everything that he could to find tools okay. or services to reduce it. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. McDonald, you had indicated to the committee that you would be willing to give any documentation uh, necessary for us to get to the bottom of this. Um, I'm asking you both, please, if you would be willing to submit both your calendar as well as uh, meeting invites from the period of January 2019 to June of 2023. If you would please submit those to the committee, please. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I have no problems with the CBSA submitting those. Uh, I, I can submit from uh, May uh, 3rd until uh, now when I was at Health Canada, but I don't have access to uh, my, my calendar from the CBSA. Let's be real. If he was smart, which he seems to be smart, most of the interactions, even if it was via email, and dealing with all this shady stuff is not going to be within a CBSA email. It's going to be on his personal email. Let's be real. Sorry about the ads, everybody. We can't control that. Okay, thank you. We'll, so uh, we'll work with the CBSA to obtain those. Um, I wanted to go back to something that my Liberal colleague said, and it was this was the $54 million uh, price tag. Do you agree with that $54 million price tag? Do you think that this, this uh, application was worth $54 million? If you're directing the question to me, I left yes. when ArriveCan was at $6.3 million. Okay. I believe out of the $54 million, there were things that are outside of IT. $8 million or $7 million went to Service Canada to, to do things. Uh, when I look at the cost over three years, um, I think if you were to look at major IT systems, which I would consider this a major IT system, I would think that uh, it's less expensive than what people are making it out to be. I also, I just want to underline, what? Yeah, we know no everything that happened now, so it's really easy to rebuild something that's been built. It's called like a model. Uh, we didn't have a model to follow when we built ArriveCan. They were coming up with things in real time. This started off as a replacement of a piece of paper. Okay, um, stop. Yeah, a $54 million replacement for a piece of paper. No, stop. This this guy, so what he was just saying, he's trying to, you know, he's trying to put forward that they were building the wheel for the first time. Rule number one with government is they're always last. They are far behind everyone else in terms of technology. So that's number one. Number two. Are you serious? This was a survey. It had a QR code reader. It had facial recognition. You can, like, you're, you're, you're sitting there trying to say that facial recognition 
was never was never done before. Ask everybody who's ever used what was it? What was that app? Smart Chat? No, no, it was uh, Snapchat. Snapchat. Like, give me a break. You're you're ser- and and you're trying to say, oh yeah, fifty four million dollars. That, that's a that's a bargain, really. This guy's been working. By the way, Cameron has worked in government basically his whole life, so that explains some things. A piece of paper that cost about three dollars each. So when we think about 40 million transactions on ArriveCan, I, I like to think about it as an overall cost savings but to the government But do you think the, the app could have been designed for, for less money than $54 million? I think if you had have taken an approach of knowing all of the business requirements when you start, we probably could have saved some money, but we didn't know what the requirements were. We didn't know what waves of, of the variants were going to be, and we didn't know how to necessarily, well, I'll leave the politics aside. The business requirements came from FAC, and all we were trying to do was streamline uh, the, the, the border and, and get information so that the streamlining of those people crossing the border You guys shouldn't be allowed anywhere be near IT that, systems. That, that was what I'm hearing was. you say is that it, it, it could have been designed for, for less money than, than the $54 million that it was. Um, design for. Can Did I you want to add something yeah, briefly, Mr. Gatano? So I would agree with that comment in a normal circumstance and not a pandemic. Okay. I think so. And the number two, and we were on that trajectory of developing our employees to become autonomous in this capability and, and, to, and these, uh, these skill sets, but it just takes time. Unfortunately, the pandemic hit as we were trying to establish that. So oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. My uh, nine million to uh, GC strategies like that money certainly could have been saved there. Uh, my last question is: Bottler has said, or the the principals of Bottler have indicated that senior government officials could potentially be receiving kickbacks, both direct kickbacks as well as indirect kickbacks for both ArriveCan and potentially other contracts as well. Do you have any direct knowledge? about senior government officials, either uh, bureaucratic or elected, receiving any form of kickback? I have absolutely no knowledge of any senior bureaucrat receiving kickbacks. I can honestly tell you that I have never received one and I competed for my job as was opposite to the inference that was made at this committee. Why is he offering so much extra information? We didn't Answer ask us yes you. or no. We didn't ask you. We didn't ask you if you'd receive them. But Spontaneous you, utterance? But you need to tell us that you didn't receive any. We didn't ask you that. Wow. Well, I hope Stephanie Cousy is like, w would you be uh, okay with submitting your bank records? I hope so. And that's my, my testimony as well. I not, I'm not aware of anybody who's received any sort of kickbacks. Uh, thank you. With my last time, Chair, I will um, just briefly ask, where are we at for, with the witnesses, the PSPC witnesses on Thursday, please? Um, just very quickly, we have three for Thursday. Uh, we are getting a bit of the runaround okay. for having them okay. um, appear, unfortunately. They verbally have said, but they w are refusing to put it in writing. I suspect that's probably what did where you we're say, going. Mr. Jouari? Yes, thank you. I suspect that. What I a great idea, that. Um, Mr. Jouari. Ask committee's permission to leave it with me with the names that I have. Yeah, they agree to be summoned. Perfect. I imagine one of those witnesses is Ms. Diane Daly, who threatened Butler with extortion. <laughs> yeah, summon everybody. Just skip it. Summon everybody. Don't even worry about asking. Just summon. And the interesting thing is, is uh, the, the meeting's actually not... Uh, on the on the docket on uh, on on Thursday yet, but I imagine it will be once they kind of nail this down. Require me to read anything into the record, Chair. Yes, yeah, sorry, this is the ones for Thursday. Correct. We are summoning okay. for Thursday officially. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And the names, sorry, I'll just yep. read it off because sure, these please. are the ones that we have posted. It's Angela Durigan, Anita Chan. Savannah Mansur. 
Oh, really? That is your time. Mr. Souza. Oh, because Diane Daly's not in PhD. Yeah, thank you. Diane Daly's not um, in Health Canada. So Butler's engagement in, was prior to the pandemic, correct? No contracting was done until after the pandemic. The first initiation, if you will, the first series of meetings was prior to the pandemic, yes. And you made mention that they were at not Butler specifically and not GC Strategy specifically, but certainly uh, the contract tour, right? That, that's who, we, who was put in place. And yet they delivered a pool instead of a kitchen, I think you were making a reference to. They were not really doing the deliverables that were anticipated, correct? Butler keeps saying that they did all of this work and that they were owed all of this money. They configured their platform as, I think, a specific example. We never asked them to configure their platform. We Fair never enough. asked them to do any IT work whatsoever. We asked them to prepare an evaluation about whether or not their platform would even be suitable for the CBSA. Yeah. Really? Show us the contract then, Cam. Yeah, how are you contracting an IT company? Without not, a contract. Like, well, but not to do IT work. Like, explain that. None of this makes sense. In comments that they provided this committee, uh, we, I asked specifically if they were compliant, if in fact there was any disagreement with their price and their contract. And they said no. They said they had complied with the issues, but now you're telling us that was not the case. All, all I can tell you, sir, is I helped write the statement of work. I worked with colleagues in HR, in finance, to develop a statement of work which got translated into contracting things. There are six deliverables here. None of them are a pilot or configuration of technology. Then how were two of them signed off on the page? Just to make sure I, we have it understood. Yeah. I, I get that. Listen, bottom line, this committee is concerned. We're concerned with the, the, the allegations that are being made. We're concerned by... Uh, supposed nefarious activities. You've heard some of the line of questioning, talking about people not speaking the truth, and basically they're in the take. They're on the take. So we're, we're concerned that that act kind of activity is existing, and court public opinion is taking low because social media is picking up on it too. And obviously you've been targeted in some of these respects. <laughs> so I'm going to give you an opportunity to clarify some of that once again because this is one of my final opportunities to ask you questions oh on this issue. And we want trust in the system, a system that's been existing for how long? How long have you been involved in this? 23 Multiple years. different parties, different governments, correct? Mm -hmm. And well, do you see value fault. in the work that companies like GC Strategy provides? I mean, you obviously use them. So how many kickbacks does Mr. everybody Chair, think Sousa's got? Members of this committee. Like, geez. I can understand and I someone. can appreciate some of the questions that are being asked well. and why they're being targeted the way that they are. A general contractor, when you're doing a whole bunch of renovations on your house, is beneficial because they're a single throat to choke. In the case of the private sector and their partnerships, my understanding is that PSPC welcomes partnerships. I think there are a lot of discussion around this table around whether or not subcontracting is useful and whether it's good. As an IT guy, as a as a guy who's worked in IT for 19 of the 20 years that I, 23 years I've been in government, that's not for me to decide and it's not for me to judge. I do think that governments of any color can decide to change policies if they would like to, to allow or change the methods of subcontracting. And that's a discussion that may need to take place. That's a, a study this committee may want to undertake. But in terms of nefarious activities and some of the things that have been suggested that's at this hurtful. committee, that's I have hurtful. never seen that in my entire life. I have never seen something called ghost contracting. I have never what? witnessed or I would turn a blind eye. And I don't think Mr. I know Mr. Utana wouldn't either to anybody stealing from the government. Are you kidding? What do you mean you've never been a witness to something called ghost contracting? Like you saw it. What the hell do you think Butler was complaining to you about? Don Boulay says it's only because you guys got caught bang on. Yeah. Right there. And I bet you this guy, I bet you Cam, most of what he was practicing was his facial expressions in the mirror. How, okay, where's my victim face? I need to really understand what my victim face is. Yeah, he sounds like he's acting right now. Like he's whining, he's acting. Like it's gross. It sounds like a speech. It sounds like a yeah. rehearsed speech. Yeah. I'm not sure how much time I have left, Mr. Tano. It's been alleged that in this, in this committee, you have to speak the truth. You're obliged. We've heard from the whistleblowers. 
the individuals that came forward with these issues, are they telling the truth? Mr. Speaker, with respect to the allegations that were levied against me from our September 27th email, I provided the actual email and the responses. To, from, from that perspective, I believe they've been they've 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 misled. They've misled people in that direction. Anything else that was not involved myself in particular? I'll leave Mr. It to the committee. I believe they've misled this committee. They wow. worked with GC Strategies. They went to ten different departments. They they've systematically told this committee that they thought they were going to make $26 million a year, that Mr. Utano had, had told them they were going to make $62 mil or $26 million, my apologies, a year. There were no such commitments made. There was no contracting put in place. The CBSA would never have contracted for the federal government. And, and even in terms of that, as I've clearly stated, the client for Bottler wasn't IT. The Dude, Bottler didn't say that they were gonna be owed 26 million. What they said is you went to Christian Firth. Firth came to them. And part of the pitch from Firth was I can get you guys in and I know the president and, and Cam has the inside track and yada, yada, yada. And I know all of these DGs um, and, and deputy ministers, assistant deputy ministers. I know all of these people and and if we get this across the federal government, which I'm pretty sure we can do, that could that could be a a, a 20, 20 odd million dollar contract. My fee is twenty percent. That's what they've offered forward. So you can you can try and spin that, and you're te you're telling us that they're misleading committee. Really, give me a break. client was HR. If the client didn't want that work, they didn't do the work. So I, I mean, I left a month and a half after the Bottler work started. I, I, I can't speak to the work and I can't speak to the complaints and I can't speak to the allegations that came a year later. All I can tell you is that the CBSA has never contacted me about Arrive Can or Bottler. The RCMP has never contacted me about Not Bottler. Yet. And I've, I've done my best to provide a fulsome recollection of events so this committee understands what my actions were yeah that, and I that's can probably what his package is is just recollection thank you thank you very much quote unquote. mr mcdonald mr utano thank you for your time today uh, all right wow that last statement last series of statements by mcdonald was just gross yeah um it actually really hurt him in my opinion um they um <laughs> yeah it's something else it really is something else um i saw a comment on the volume uh th the problem is is the audio for some reason on this specific committee is really really low well um, and you can hear that the audio was screwed up during the translation like there was no translation yeah so uh so we do apologize about that. Uh, there's not a lot we can do. Um, when when we're pre-recording episodes, that's when we can equalize the volume very easily. It's it's very difficult to do that uh, um, real time, uh, but it it is what it is. Anyhow, um, yeah, I'm 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 not not. Oh man, that was just something else listening to to him. But you know, he's been around for twenty three years in government. Again, he's not a stupid guy. He can't be a stupid guy to to, to survive that long. But Brock and the Conservatives obviously are seeing through this, and I think they're interested to see the evidence that he is putting forward because he he hasn't seen what Bottler has already put forward and the difference that I think we're going to see because Cam said, Oh, I don't have my emails from, <laughs> from CBSA. The difference is, is that Bottler is going to have emails with timestamps, with names, dates. And if they want to corroborate that, all the conservatives have to do is request for those inform uh, for, for those emails from the government email systems. So it's easy for them to corroborate. I think most of what Cam's magical little package is, is just 
him just writing things down because he allegedly doesn't have those emails anymore. But we'll see. And I think Mr. Doan's going to come back and be like, okay, so you want to throw me under the, uh, the bus, Cam? Here we go. Yeah, I can't wait for that committee. Because I th- if I was that guy and, and I was doing like dirty, shady shit with the rest of these guys and they were throwing me under the bus, you best believe I would be out for blood. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So, you know, first going to come back. He has now seen what Cameron has said. Um, Doan's going to come back. He's seen what he said. I love that they're going to be asking for Doan to come in alone. That's going to be fun. So, we'll see what happens. Um, $5 super chat from Don Wickenden. 1,429 kilometer aviation run. We got home at 10. Started from the beginning, so I'm late at the party, but cheers. <laughs> uh, thank well, you very much. I'm glad you can make it. So, anyway, uh, we're going to probably wrap this up, but... Um, please, please, please stay tuned for the episode tomorrow. It's, it'll probably be dropped late because there's a lot of work that I'm going to have to do on it. I I hope I can get it done tomorrow. Um, but considering the, um, the emails that, that I've received, um, I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, And, um, again, lots and lots of respect to the people of Butler. It's, it's, I said it before, it's, it's David versus Goliath. It really, really is. And this can't be understated, like, or sorry, I'm tired. It can't be overstated that, that these two folks at Butler, we are learning all of this because of them. Like they're the whistleblowers. They got the ball rolling and, and, you know, I imagine it's been an incredibly tough fight for them, especially fighting against the CBSA and, and, you know, they're threatening you and they're withholding your money and, and, and Ritika Dutt and Amir Moore, they just, they've persevered and, and they said, you know what, we're going to do what's right and we're going to show Canadians exactly what's been going on. Yeah. Um, We've we've talked about the emails. We're gonna we're gonna show you know pieces from them. We've talked about the documentation. We're gonna show pieces of it, um, and we're gonna be showing some of the other evidence that ties. We're gonna be showing some evidence that ties, Mister Wood. To Christian Firth. To his partner. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, Darren Anthony, as well as a couple of other people. Um, all of these people are tied together. We're going to be showing you the documents where Arrive Can, as well as all of these other expenses, were approved. And um, it's it, it it paints quite the picture, and it's not even going to be all of it. It's not even going to be all of it, but we're going to continue to just break this down as best we can um, for everybody to to consume it. Um, he doesn't know it yet, but we're actually going to be asking Clyde if he would also distribute this as well, because this this is not just a Northern perspective thing. This is this is something Canadians need to know, and you know we're we're going to see if we can partner with with a couple of other channels as well. Um, may even reach out to Celtic Canuck because I know a lot of people, you know, uh, like the work that she's doing. Um, we need this content out there. People need to see it. Canadians need to know. And, you know, when we drop this video, we're going to ask you folks to share it as well because Canadians need to see this. Tell your friends, tell your family, share the heck out of it because this is our tax money that these guys are stealing. Yeah. And um, please, 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 uh, the the people watching this right now, all 560 of you, and uh, if you're watching this after the fact, please just do us a favor and, and share tomorrow's video. Share this video, but share tomorrow's video. 
um, it's important. It's really, really important. So anyhow, um, tomorrow, um, we will, uh, we will have another video. Um, we may be able to reveal our source tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. Um, but it's one o'clock Eastern here and let's get to bed everybody because, um, it's going to be a busy week. There is no live stream tomorrow. The next live stream is probably going to be on Thursday. We're going to probably do that again at nine o'clock. If that, uh, if that will work, that will be, looks like it's on the people from PSBC, uh, and, and their testimony that have been trying to duck committee. And, uh, tomorrow will be our, our pre-recorded video. So thank you everybody for joining. Thank you for all of the donations. Thank you for all of your support as usual and all of your kind words. And uh, stay tuned, everybody. This is just heating up. Good night, everyone. Thank you.